This probably isn't a super interesting ghost story or anything. Just a very strange experience I've been having at my job recently. I work at a gas station and convenience store. It's an old building and has been there for decades. I've been working there for nearly a year and a half. Our staff is small, only four of us, so we all work alone pretty often. Behind the counter leads right to the back room office through a door which is usually open. The office desk is right next to the door. You can't really see the cash register while sitting at the desk. It's just out of view. Our store is busy sometimes, but it can be completely dead at others. Usually, during these dead periods, I will sit at the back desk and just relax. A few months ago, I occasionally started to hear what sounds exactly like someone setting down a full, unopened aluminum energy drink or soda can on the counter by the register as if they were ready to pay. It's happened around four or five times total. So I'll think, wow, there's someone here. I didn't even hear them come in. Then I get up to go ring them up and there's no one there, not a soul. It only happens when I'm completely alone, like not even a car outside in the lot pumping gas alone. We have a huge obnoxious bell that goes off when the door opens. So it's impossible that someone is coming in and leaving because I would hear it. Two of my coworkers have also heard it. My manager said she just heard it this morning, went to go ring and nothing. The thing that gets me is that it's such an unmistakable sound, a full pressurized aluminum can being set down on a hard surface. I have been a cashier for years and this sound is so familiar to me. I'm sure there's a logical explanation for it, but I just can't come up with one. I'm baffled and it's the only thing close to a ghost experience I've ever had. As a child, like many others, I was accompanied by an array of imaginary friends. Among these figments of my young imagination, the one I remember distinctly was a little girl named Sophie. Sophie, approximately my age at the time, between four and six, was just an ordinary girl wearing a dress and socks. The peculiar thing about her was the noticeable crook in her neck. I grew up in an old house, possibly around 80 years old, with our next door neighbor who we affectionately referred to as Grandma and who has lived there for 60 years. This fact bears significance to the story. Sophie was my closest friend during my early years, a phenomenon not uncommon among children. We spent a lot of time talking and playing in my room, but she never ventured downstairs, claiming fear. It was a usual occurrence for me to descend the staircase, turn back and reassure her Hey, see, it's okay. You can come down. Regardless, she would stay put, a fact I found utterly perplexing. As I aged, my interactions with Sophie dwindled, and ultimately, she faded from my memory. That was until, after relocating, my mother and I paid a visit to Grandma and began reminiscing about my childhood spent in the old house. My mother mentioned my habit of addressing the staircase when I was young, which piqued grandma's curiosity, prompting her to ask, who were you speaking to? I casually answered, oh, Sophie, and I started to describe her. Grandma fell into a silent contemplation. After a while, she said, you know, when I initially moved into this house, my neighbors were preparing to move out. Tragically, a month before their departure, their daughter slipped and fell down the staircase, succumbing to her injuries. She had broken her neck. You know, I do believe her name was Sophie.
In 2013, following my amicable divorce from my wife, we both relocated to separate residences. We've remained good friends, largely due to our shared parenthood of our daughter. To ensure fair custody, I rented an appealing house located in the city's historic district. Constructed in 1935, it was well-preserved and offered a perfect home for our three-year-old daughter during her fortnightly stays with me. It was during these visits that I began to notice my daughter conversing with an unseen friend. On one occasion, I discovered her in a tiny closet, deep in conversation with a little girl that she referred to as Betty. Considering her age, I assumed this was a product of her vibrant imagination, particularly as I had no idea where she had heard the name Betty. As a single dad to a little girl, I struggled with some aspects of parenting, particularly tasks like hairstyling. While her mother had a knack for it, I was left floundering. One evening, I put her to bed following a bath and remember giving her a quick hairbrush, but that was the extent of my hairstyling capabilities. The following morning when my daughter was just rising, her mom came to pick her up. She discovered our daughter's hair had been transformed into flawless fringe braids. Initially, she praised me for managing such an intricate hairstyle, but I assured her that I had not, and could not, have done it. When we quizzed our daughter about her braids, she said, Betty did them during the night. Aren't they pretty? This incident prompted me to break my lease, and we moved out within the next month. Betty did not come with us. Several years ago, when I was 20 years old, I resided in a little apartment. The building was part of a duplex constructed back in the 1950s. My landlord, who was a distant relative, was very well versed in the property's history. One afternoon, after tidying up and doing some laundry, I chose to unwind with a book and a steaming cup of coffee. I nestled into my daybed, as my small apartment left no room for both a couch and a bed. As the coffee brewed, I delved into my hardback special edition book, which had broken a spine due to countless readings. This allowed the book to lay flat open when placed down. The final gurgles of the coffee pot pulled me from the story. I left the book open on my daybed and went to get my coffee. As I turned to return to my daybed, there she was. She seemed to be in her twenties, dressed in a long brown skirt paired with a green top. Her style, her clothes, her hair seemed to be inspired by the late 1930s or the early 40s. She was comfortably seated on my daybed, her legs tucked beneath her, barefoot with her stockings resting nearby. To my surprise, she was engrossed in my book. She lifted her gaze, saw me, offered an impish, somewhat embarrassed grin, like a child caught in mischief, and then vanished into thin air. Stunned, I found myself frozen, my eyes fixated on the spot where she had been. I remained motionless for so long that when I finally snapped out of it, my freshly brewed coffee had gone cold. I hastily called my mom to tell her about it. The apparition was so solid, so realistic. I could not see through her. I initially thought she might have been associated with the property, but the duplex and its environs were built in the 50s, and her attire was definitely from an earlier era. I never saw her again, and I haven't had any other experiences of this sort since then, but the memory of this encounter remains etched in my mind. It wasn't scary or uncomfortable. In fact, I continued to live in that apartment for several more years, and every night, before retiring to bed, I would leave the book open on a new page in my kitchen, just in case she wanted to continue her reading.
I worked at a restaurant located in a remote town in Michigan. Do you recall that show Ghost Hunters? Well, they actually investigated our place a few years back. From what I've been told, there are two spirits here, a little girl and a man. On my first day, curious about the ghostly rumors linked to the TV show's visit, I asked a coworker about it. As she was leaving the room, she casually mentioned, Oh yeah, there's a little girl ghost here. Just as she said that, something knocked the tool we used to retrieve pizzas from the oven right to the floor. Months later, that same coworker shared another eerie tale. She claimed the spirit would turn on the radio even when it was unplugged. I was skeptical, until one particular incident. It was a bustling Friday evening, with karaoke in full swing, making the restaurant quite noisy. Directly above us is an old, condemned apartment, perpetually vacant. Out of nowhere, we heard a series of thunderous steps coming from the ceiling, as if something was charging across that room. Suddenly, an entire stack of full-length hotel pans, each measuring about three feet by one foot and eight inches deep, were violently thrown off the shelf in our kitchen. The resulting clatter was deafening, like a cacophony of stainless steel crashing down onto tile floor. These pans, stacked together, must have weighed around 40 pounds. Just moments before this chaos, I had called out to the manager across the room, asking, did you hear that? About the thundering upstairs. I had this gut feeling that it was the ghost. The restaurant was loud, but the noise above was unmistakably distinct. Before he could even nod in acknowledgement, the stack of pans was flung to the floor. The most chilling part? Our 18-year-old dishwasher was directly in front of the shelf and witnessed the pans being hurled. The shock on her face was something I will never forget. In all, four of us heard the phantom footsteps, one saw the pans being thrown by nothing, and several others were startled by the clamor. Given what I've experienced, it's hard for me to remain skeptical. The only other explanation might be a very elaborate prank, but that seems even more far-fetched given the people that I work with. I grew up in an apartment complex for the first six years or so. It's been so long that I don't really remember it, but I know that I lived in an apartment complex near Meyer. We ended up moving into my grandmother's house with her after my grandfather passed away, and I remember some disturbances at a young age. The first time I ever had something paranormal happen was when I was helping my mom and grandma clean out my grandpa's old room, so then my mother and I could use it as our room. I was scared to be alone as a kid, so I slept in my mom's room. They had separate rooms. My grandma had converted one of the living rooms into her bedroom. One day, we were taking a break from cleaning the room. We were hanging out in my grandma's room, and I can't remember what it was exactly. Still, my mom asked me to go to my grandpa's room to grab something that she'd forgotten. It may have been a drink. As I walk toward his room, I hear the most ghostly moan I have ever heard in my life. It was almost like something out of Scooby-Doo. I ran back to my mom and grandma, and they said that I was just being silly. The typical answer that a child would always get from adults after telling a story like that. And my mom was an atheist who tried to explain and debunk everything she could. Occasionally, I would hear stuff, see shadows, and feel like someone was watching me. Still, I was never genuinely bothered by anything. My grandma would have liked to think that it was my grandpa just messing around, but I was never really sure. I just knew that things were happening that I couldn't explain, and I didn't like it. As a kid, 
I loved horror games. I loved watching scary movies and stuff like Ghost Hunters, which did scare me and kept me up some nights. Still, it was always interesting to me because I believed my house was haunted, but I liked to pretend that it wasn't so I could sleep at night. My mom died November 5th of 2006, and ever since that day, things got weird, and the feelings of being watched, noises, and shadows increased, but nothing really significant. I thought it was because my grandma had like six cats, so they were probably just messing things up. One night in particular that I remember was when my friend came over to spend the night. We played video games, and he in particular loved to talk to me about his dreams, because they were so creative and vivid that they could have been comic books. Well, we went to sleep, and before that I closed my bedroom door, because one of the cats would always come in the room and wake us up by licking plastic for like an hour straight. Almost suddenly, out of a dead sleep, I woke up. No reason behind it, I just did. I'm drawn to look at the bedroom door as it slowly opens, and an almost pitch black cloud hovers into my room, staying close to the ceiling. As that's happening, my friend is yelling in his sleep, no, stop. At this time, not only am I scared beyond belief, but I have the strangest, most eerie feeling that I have ever felt. I was so afraid, but simultaneously so tired that I just covered my face with my blanket. I eventually passed out and woke up the next day. Everything is seemingly normal. I asked my friend about that night and he said he didn't see, feel, or hear anything. When I asked him about his dream, he said, I actually can't remember it. That struck me as absolutely wild because this guy would always tell me about how cool his dreams were. I mean, he remembered all of them. There were other things I can remember. My dad one night said that he was intoxicated and opened his door to go upstairs to grab some food out of the fridge when he said he ran into my mom as he walked out of the door and as he stumbled back and looked, he said nobody was there. But from his face and how sobering of an experience it was, I couldn't see how he would make that up. However, all of us would occasionally hear my mom's voice calling out to us, and I would freeze and look in every direction, trying to find where it came from. Fast forward to about 2013, a year or so before I eventually moved out of the house. My grandmother's health and brain were deteriorating rapidly until she finally called 911 and went to the ER, where she was diagnosed with brain and lung cancer almost identical to what my mom had when she passed. After what seemed to be a month, she passed away. And ever since that day, that house was not the same. It was odd before then, but after that, it went from 20 to 100. Stuff being knocked over, voices echoing from the hallways and basement, loud voices talking from other rooms when you were alone in the house, people coughing right in your ear, shadows walking down the hall, doors being slammed in the basement. The list goes on and on. I had a friend move into my house who always told me that when he went downstairs to shower, somebody would shake the bathroom door handle while he was in there. He said that he would open it multiple times to find nobody on the other side. However, he was still trying to figure out how I was doing it until one day he realized that I wasn't, because I had another friend come over to my house because he wanted help dyeing his hair. The friend who had his hair dyed went downstairs to take a shower, and when he came back upstairs, my buddy and I were playing video games. He walked in and said, okay, how the heck did you guys get up here so fast without making a noise? We were puzzled as heck, until he told us that somebody kept shaking the door handle. My other friend went pale and told him exactly what had been happening to him. At that point, we were all pretty freaked out and left the house for a bit. He stopped coming over as much and honestly, I don't blame him. He vowed to never shower at my home again. 
Between hearing doors in the basement and seeing shadows, my dad kept telling me that when he was home alone, he would just hear my mom and grandma screaming his name from other parts of the house, which he says drove him back into alcoholism. If you're squeamish about animals, you might want to skip this next sentence. But one morning, I woke up to find my grandma's last cat had died shortly before we moved out. When I say the intensity of these encounters got worse, I mean it. All my friends that came over just said the house did not feel right, and they didn't feel welcome. We would always hear voices or cats meowing, even though by this point all of the cats had passed. I would go into my basement before work and open all of the doors, and when I would get home, I would check to find that pretty much all of the doors were closed when no one could have been in the house. This is all just my perspective. My friends, and roommate especially, have their own crazy stories that still get me to this day, no matter how many times I hear them. Ever since I moved out and into a new apartment and now a trailer, I have experienced nothing at all, and it's been a nice change of pace. I honestly hope to never experience anything paranormal ever again. This happened when I was little, and I recently remembered it when talking to my parents this weekend about strange things we did as a kid. They told me that this one spoils them to this day, and after talking, I actually have one or two vague memories of it. This story took place when my family and I still lived in a small neighborhood in Alabama. We had moved into a small house that had a backyard, which connected to a small forest. I believe I was six at the time, and my younger brother had just been born. My parents got the house for less than expected, and were excited to start a new life in this quiet neighborhood. The first night at the house, my parents said they heard scratching coming from somewhere in the house. My dad said that he brushed it off as being an animal from the forest nearby, or maybe a mouse, and went back to sleep. It continued for several nights though, and my dad eventually grew tired of it. One night, he decided to look and see what was causing the scratching noise. He found me kneeling at and scratching the door that led to the basement. He tried talking to me, but I would just continue to scratch. My dad watched me for a minute before I finally stopped scratching and walked back to my room. The next morning, he asked me about why I was up, and according to him, I didn't know what he was talking about. My parents took me to the doctor, and they told them that the most logical cause was that I was having night terrors, since it appeared to occur nightly. My parents accepted this as an answer, for a while. The thing was, I would only have night terrors in that specific house. Whenever we would spend the night at my grandparents, or I would have a sleepover at my friend's house, I never had these night terrors. And then there came one part that I somehow remember. It happened when I was a little older, around 9 or 10. I remember waking up in the hallway, where the basement door was. I didn't remember getting up, and I was confused as to how I got there. I remember turning my head to see what looked like an elderly man. He had a kind of yellowish glow to him, and he was staring right at me. I don't remember feeling threatened by him though. I think I might have fallen asleep again, because the next thing I remember is waking up in the hallway again, but this time it was morning. After the night where I saw the old man, my parents said my night terrors stopped. We moved out of that house several years later, when I was getting ready to go into the third grade. My parents brought up this story because they told me that recently, one of our old neighbors had done some research on the house. What they found out was that an old man had unalived himself in the basement of that house years before my family had moved in. 
Our neighbor didn't tell them the full story over what led to that, but my parents believe that that might have been the old man that I saw that night. I'm now 20 years old and I'm enrolled in college. Neither I nor my parents have been back to that house since we moved out of it. In a way, I kind of want to visit, just one last time, to see if maybe I could find out about the old man. I'm just really curious about him. Either way, it was an experience I doubt my parents will forget anytime soon. My husband's parents live in a tiny town in Alabama. They've lived there a long time. We went to visit them a few years back, and we were excited to get out of town for a bit, see some different scenery. His sister was graduating college, and we were going to celebrate. She is also an avid ghost hunter and believer. So when I told her about some of my experiences, she was excited to take me to some of the haunted locations around town cemeteries, old abandoned houses, and even a Hell's Gate, which we didn't actually end up going to, as I told her I had a bad feeling and refused. We drove around almost all night, just looking at different locations and talking about the history of the town. A lot of residual energy and weird feelings as we went to all these different places. We came to a cemetery in a new portion of town, Fancy houses surrounded it on three sides only. On the third side was a small canyon area of land. Nothing really felt off. The cemetery was new and didn't have many headstones yet. It was fenced off with ornate wrought iron fencing. We didn't see anything lurking, no shadows darting from tree to tree or headstone to headstone. It was just there. After walking around to the open side, where there were no houses, I asked his sister, let's call her Beth, how come there were no houses on this one side? She shrugged and said that they had stopped building months ago, even though this was supposed to be a new subdivision. They had purchased all this land and probably needed to figure out a way to build upon it since it was very canyon-like. We decided to get a closer look at the canyon area, although we couldn't see much since it was dark, and our only lights were the street lights. We had walked far enough to be outside of what they illuminated. Far off in the distance, I saw what looked like a campfire. I pointed it out, but no one else saw it. Beth began to have a sinking feeling, and before she could say anything, I started getting a massive headache. I heard pounding like drums. I got flashes of images in my head, of Native Americans dancing around a big fire. The night sky seemed blacker and darker than it had before. Beth grabbed my arms and said we needed to leave. My husband was already halfway back to the car. As I turned my back to the canyon, it was almost as though I had a twinge of fear run up my spine and a shiver, like I was somewhere we weren't supposed to be. So we ran back to the car. As we drove away, I could feel a black mass following our car as we drove the winding streets back to the main road. It felt big and foreboding, like it was flying behind us. I started to panic and I felt my throat and chest tighten. Once we crossed the main road, it was almost like it couldn't follow us past that point, but I could feel it watching us as we continued back to his parents' house. I asked Beth if she had seen anything, but she refused to talk about it. None of us slept that night, and my headache didn't subside until morning. I did some research on the area the next day and found that it was home to the Chickasaw Indian tribe back in the day. I have Blackfoot and Choctaw blood and later thought that maybe, since I was a neighboring tribe, they didn't want me there. Regardless, we have never spoken of the incident since.
For context, I live in Germany. My boyfriend's childhood home is old. How old, nobody knows exactly. It might have been built around the beginning of the 20th century, but it could be older. It's a three-level house with a huge archway at the first floor that marks its age. There are two stories I want to tell you. The first one happened when we had just started dating. My boyfriend had searched for his room key for quite a while. It appeared to be lost forever. One day I entered his room and there was the key, laying perfectly placed in the middle of the bed. When he came home from work, I mentioned that I was glad he had found his key. He looked at me confused and I pointed at the door where I put the key in. He said, I never found it. Later we asked his parents and sister if they had placed it there but they denied it. To this day, we don't know how it ended up there. The second story happened pretty recently. The building has two front doors. The inner front door squeaks remarkably if you open it, so everyone knows when somebody's coming inside. My boyfriend's mother and I sat at the dinner table. His dad was watching soccer on the TV next to us on the third floor. My boyfriend and his sister were out of the house. Suddenly, my mother-in-law and I heard the front door. Then another door-like sound. Oh, someone must have come in, my mother-in-law said. She went down the first stair and said, hello. No answer. She decided to take a look herself. Not a single soul in sight. At the exact moment she went down to look, my boyfriend opened the door and came in, just to see the two of us confused we asked if he was mocking us. He affirmed that he hadn't even been inside before, so the door wasn't him. He and his mom both told me that these kinds of things have happened to them before. Doors open, things move, sometimes you hear steps that aren't supposed to be there. Apparently they call their ghost Herbert, after their uncle that passed away a few years ago. I guess it's a friendly soul. I was little, like kindergarten starting first grade little. I lived in Germany at the time due to being an army brat. My little sister is two years younger than me, so we did everything together. We lived in a two-story farmhouse style home, and my little sister and I were playing in our room. I don't remember when he came, but we started playing with a boy a little bit older than us. I don't remember ever seeing him, just talking to him and playing games and other kid stuff. It was like he kind of just appeared. My sister and I would later realize that the little farm boy was kind of a jerk because he would turn off the lights in whatever room we were in, mostly our bedroom, and lock the doors. We would find each other in the dark, scared, but also a little bit annoyed. I remember telling my sister to try to find the light and I would get the door. They were both next to each other. I couldn't open the door, so I began to bang on it, when my sister, in a panicked voice, said that she couldn't find the light. I was kind of mad scared, and I thought that she was pulling my leg. And she was small, so I was like, move over, let me try. I felt around the area where I know the light switch was, but all I found was a wall. Confused, I decided to find the bottom of the wall use both of my hands and just slide them all the way up as high as I could. Nothing. I then told my sister to do what I had just done and I would do the same at the top, but we would do kind of a slow zigzag pattern just in case we weren't going far enough. Our hands eventually grazed each other and we realized we couldn't find a thing. There was no light switch. So I turned back to the door and I ordered my little sister to start banging on the door and screaming. We did this for what felt like forever. I was even more confused because mom should be making dinner right now and dad would be getting home soon or he already was. My other older sisters were never home so they weren't on my list of rescuers. My little sister and I started to give up. 
thinking that this was just our life now, in the dark next to the door. We weren't about to go into the abyss behind us. Then, all of a sudden, our mom came to the door, and we shouted that we were stuck. Dad got us out, and my little sister and I were pissed. We thought they were being mean and meant to do that to us. We started saying, didn't you hear us? We were shouting and banging on the door. They looked confused and said, we never heard anything. We told them about the farm boy and that we didn't want to play with him if he kept doing that. We actually played with that boy until we left and I'm still quite miffed about some of the things that he did. But looking back on it, I don't know. That's one heck of a prank, right? Starting to wonder what that boy was really up to, if he was even a little boy at all. So this story might be a bit long, but it sure was a fun one. For me personally, anyway, as I rather enjoy these kinds of things. I come from a very religious family, and a lot of us have had paranormal encounters. My grandmother's house was haunted by someone who apparently hung themselves in the backyard many years before they even built the house. To this day, they frequently have priests come in and bless every room in the house. So many of my family members have been able to see things that the regular eye cannot, including me from a young age, when I used to see things in my house, which once even drove me to run into a locked door hard enough to get a concussion. That's another story for another day. Anyway, this story takes place around late October of last year. I am a student at Stellenbosch University in South Africa, so most of my friends lived in their own flats around campus. And my one friend, Bianca, had lived in a small one-person flat that was really quiet and small, basically a long hallway of a room leading onto a balcony. So we all used to hang out in her room while listening to music, playing Uno, drinking beer, and getting really stoned until early in the morning, as all good students do. We had this game that we called the universe game, where you basically just ask the universe a question, and she had this mega playlist of songs, so she would put it on ultimate shuffle, and whatever song would play after the question would be the universe's answer, whatever interpretation you took from it and worked for you. So there had been a couple of nights where we'd been hanging out, and the lights would just start to flicker in weird beats. Now, my friends didn't know at the time that I could feel these kinds of things coming, before and as they happened. So they just dismissed it as the switch just freaking out a little bit. But this kept on happening more and more each day. Until one night, we were all playing the game again. And when the answer came, the lights acted up again. This time, we looked over to the light switch and saw a faded white hand at the switch, just the hand, flicking the switch. It just disappeared, and the lights went back to normal. At this point, everyone was freaking out, but I was really just kind of excited by it. For some reason, it just didn't feel like a threatening presence. It was oddly playful to me. I kept this to myself and just played along with everyone else's reactions. So, one night a few weeks after that, my friends were all out of town, and I had a key to my friend's place. I decided I would go over there and stay for a few nights, just to hang out and draw on my favorite couch. It all went smoothly, and I was actually getting some nice work done. I had been playing the universe game a lot throughout this time, and this one night, close to 3am, I was drawing and playing the game. I decided to go on to YouTube to find a random playlist to mix things up, because I don't know, I'm a rebel like that. So I find one. I ask a couple of questions and things go smoothly, and as I'm drawing, I suddenly just get a weird surge of energy through me, and at the same time the lights start going bananas. I look down at my phone, and the song playing is called Ghost. 
I had not smoked nearly enough to make that up or to see that. Anyway, I jumped up and looked around to see whatever was going on, but as usual, it ended as soon as it started. I must say that this was one of the more pleasant experiences I had ever had in this line of things, and I'm not even getting into my sleep paralysis and night terrors. I've experienced a lot of strange things, but like I said, this one was actually pretty cool, and I thought I would share. I'm 22, currently in the military, and I was an army brat until I was 12. I moved all the time, overseas twice and to 10 different states. I lived a very unusually unstable life because of this. My first life memory that I can recall, I was six. My father was stationed in Fort Sill. We lived in Lawton and this tiny brick house, very old and creepy. I recall going to take a bath before I went to bed, and I saw this odd sort of organic, amoeba-shaped, fluorescent, transparent green thing just a few feet above the bathroom tile. It floated out and disappeared. I was genuinely unconcerned and thought that I was tired. I go to bed, and in the middle of the night, this thing woke me up and had me follow it down the hallway. It leads me to the living area, where I kid you not, the whole house is full of fluorescent, transparent green people, dressed in like 1800 type clothing. I'm six at the time, so how do I even know what period clothing looks like? I couldn't tell you. I was older when I finally saw an old Western movie and recognized the clothes. These people looked at me, watched me intently, and were very still. One man stood up and began walking toward me. I remember leaving and going back to bed, scared as heck and pulling the blankets over my head. Enter the rest of my life until around the time I turned 20. From this day on, every night for several years, I would have the same dream about these things. I would ignore it. I never again followed the thing if it came for me. I didn't want to know what would happen. I was an odd, quiet kid, and I guess I just accepted that it would be this way. I didn't tell my parents for a very long time. When I got used to the dreams, and the thing, I firmly believed it began manifesting itself in different ways. For instance, if I left my bedroom and shut the door behind me, the door would unlatch and pop back open, as if somebody was behind me and needed to open the door again to follow me. My father can even confirm this to this day, and he's a complete skeptic. My belongings always moved around and would be found in odd places. The lights would be on, the doors would open. It drove my parents nuts. My best friend, we'll call her T, dubbed this very masculine presence of mine, Ed. T and I have been friends for eight years now, and she definitely had to accept Ed as well. As I got older and began driving, Ed would ride in the back seat of my car. I could hear him adjust in his seat, or the occasional arm resting on the door. It sounded as if somebody was just casually riding in the back seat. Once I was driving to a nearby town at night, and I got tired. I almost veered off the road, but something shook my shoulder and woke me up. Maybe Ed is evil, or just incredibly protective. For example, we had a rabid dog in our neighborhood once that I encountered while on a walk. This dog, foaming at the mouth, came up to me. Once it got close, it's like he got hit hard by something. Not enough to really hurt him, but just enough to get him to go away. He ducked and kind of yelped and scampered off quickly. I could never see the source of what this was. Another occasion, I had gotten mad at Ed for moving some of my things, and while going to the fridge during dinner, my whole family watched the light fixture above my head explode and shatter. Right as I said, Ed needs to get the heck out of my life. 
Luckily, I was the only one hurt and I only needed two stitches. T has some interesting stories as well, as Ed didn't always want her around. Ed only got really scary whenever we moved, or really when I moved. When I packed my things, that's when it got bad. By bad, I mean whenever we were getting ready to move again, things began happening to slow down the process. When we went from Sill to Vilsack, Germany, the power in our house repeatedly went out. Two of my boxes opened and unpacked themselves onto the floor, and our house was broken into and many things were stolen. This would become a pattern every single time we started to move. On top of that, every time we arrived somewhere new, I could feel that Ed wasn't anywhere near us from about three days to two weeks, and then he would show up. It was almost as though he had to do his own traveling to catch up. For whatever reason, Ed left me in March of 2017. I lived in an old house in Montana, in downtown Helena, a very historic mining town. The house was built in 1889. It was a duplex. I rented one unit and I lived there alone for much of the time. I had a boyfriend who I dated for a long time and we lived together for some time. He knew of Ed and while he never wanted to discuss it, he was also not really bothered by it. The day we broke up and the day he moved out and never came back, I sat in the living room crying and I said out loud to Ed that I needed to be alone. I basically begged him to leave. I heard an odd noise. It was like a choked cry, maybe a cough or a sigh, I couldn't really place it. And then things suddenly felt empty and quiet, like I had more space. I remember never feeling this way except for those short times after a move when Ed wasn't there. That's how I knew Ed had left. Ed has never returned. It's been years now, and part of me still wonders if this terrifying thing will one day come back. I never say his name out loud. I don't bring him up, and no one that knows of him says a thing. We all just know. I lived with this thing for a long, long time. He followed me to basic training too. I often wonder what Ed was. He held power over me, preferred me to treat him in a certain way. If I ever spoke badly of him, he retaliated. Although I only did that by accident a time or two. On other occasions, he protected me. I know how crazy all of this sounds. That's why only a handful of people in my personal life ever knew about Ed. All of us still really wonder what in the world he was. I once booked an Airbnb cabin nestled in the mountains of the Gold Coast with a group of friends. This cabin, with a history stretching back 100 to 200 years, was the backdrop for a series of eerie, inexplicable incidents that happened over our weekend stay. From the moment we set foot inside, an uncomfortable vibe permeated the air. The ambience seemed to tinge our moods, leaving us feeling unusually drained and edgy. The house was peppered with odd objects that only amplified the unsettling feel scissors pinned to walls, antiquated nails and farming tools repurposed as decor, unnerving masks, a heart pierced with nails mounted on the wall, rosary beads, and more. The odd occurrences commenced on our first night. As two of us lay downstairs, sleep eluding us due to an intense feeling of being watched, we were startled by a resounding crash. The door leading to a small foyer, which in turn led to the living area and rest of the house, had been hit with such a force that it trembled on its hinges. On the following night, as we relaxed on the deck overlooking the forest, we tried to mimic the loud bang to our friends who had slept through the incident. 
After we had thumped the wall three times in demonstration, we heard three heavy thuds echoing from the balcony's corner, followed by the eerie sound of a spare chair being dragged. Feeling increasingly unsafe, we opted to consolidate our sleeping arrangements, moving a mattress into a single room so we could stick together. When three of us were in the room, a window slammed shut with a loud bang. In the early hours of the night, as everyone slept soundly, I found myself awake at 3 a.m. I noticed a shadow moving across the same window that had earlier shut so abruptly, and I started recording it. In the video, a white figure entered and exited the frame, which I didn't notice until the next day. It was a clearly visible face. The final and most terrifying event happened just as dawn broke. I woke up to find a man standing at the foot of the bed. He was adorned in traditional indigenous attire, wearing a skirt and sash in red, black, and white, and brandishing a spear. His face was drawn into a severe scowl. In my initial panic, I assumed it was one of the Airbnb owners, and I shook my friend awake. She saw no one, and when I turned to look again, the figure had vanished. Overwhelmed, I felt a wave of nausea wash over me, and I asked my friend to leave the place early with me. Strangely, as soon as we were about a kilometer away from the cabin, I felt my normal self again. Last January, I was between jobs, and I had just recently had a daughter, who was at the time about five months old. My husband had been working through my pregnancy, but lost his job. We were living at my mom's house. I have an education in psychology and some experience as a counselor, so I was looking for the best I could get. But the best I could find right away was a job working as a paraprofessional in the special education department of an elementary school in a nearby suburb. The position was unique to the virus times, being that they needed someone to just sit around in the computer room while the kiddos did speech therapy over Zoom. Don't get me started on how terrible virtual speech therapy is. But anyway, my job was to just walk around the school back and forth between classrooms and the computer room, picking up kids, taking them to the Zoom room, sitting there for 30 minutes to an hour depending on the kid, taking them back, Picking up the next batch, I was overqualified, we'll say. Some days of the week were scheduled tightly, and other days of the week, I routinely had just two appointments. The school was a ginormous horseshoe shape, housing 700 elementary school children. I was located all the way at the far back on one side of the pre-K wing. It could take 15 minutes to walk all the way across the building and back when the kids I was picking up were in the older grades. Every day I would make this walk. In the middle of the school, across from the front office, I would always notice, and try to ignore, this strange rag doll with construction paper over its face, showcased in a display case. No bad vibes from it, but it just seemed out of place. And random. It was there the entire five months that I worked there, never changing or having anything added to the case. Onward. Well, weird things happened in the computer room where I worked. The doors in the school use a key to lock from both the inside and outside. The doors do not lock automatically. You absolutely 100% have to manually lock them with a key. We are technically supposed to lock rooms when we leave them empty throughout the day, but no one ever did. So I just left my door unlocked when I went to get the kids. I would go get a kid in pre-K, so they'd literally be like two classrooms away, less than a minute to pick them up and walk back. My door would be locked by the time I returned. Sometimes I would be gone longer, but sometimes that's all it would take, just 60 seconds. 
I messed around with the door in my free time, trying to figure out how it was locking. The only conclusion I could come up with was that somebody was manually locking it when I was gone. I asked the janitor, because he was always around, and he said no, he'd never done it. I asked if it could lock itself, and he said no, it's not possible. So I came to the conclusion that somebody was messing with me, trying to teach me a lesson for not locking my door or something passive aggressively. Well, I don't play that. So I texted my boss, the vice principal, and I asked her to come talk to me when she had some time. I explained the situation to her and she said that she was sure that nobody would ever do something like that. She also said she would have maintenance look at the door. That was the end of it. I come back after the weekend and the door is broken, like off kilter on the hinges so it won't even shut all the way. I guess locking on its own won't be a problem anymore. The school did have security cameras in the halls. I wonder if they had any video of me pushing the doorknob down to check that it was unlocked before walking off, returning and having it being locked. Anyway, after that, there was a day where I went to get a kid out of his classroom in the pre-K wing by my office, but they switched up the schedule that day so the class wasn't in there. I shrugged it off, went to go pick up the other kid that also sat in there for this block, and then came back. There was another paraprofessional watching her own kids in the playroom nearby, so I asked her if she knew where the other class would be right now. She said she didn't know, but that she thought she had just seen a kid run in there. Maybe they were going in to use the bathroom. I said, okay, and I went back into the empty classroom. I have the other little kid with me at this point. There's a bathroom at the back of the class, but it's open. I walk over there, confused, and check the room. I even look behind the door, and there is no kid. I shrug my shoulders at the other little one and begin walking back toward the exit of the room. The bathroom door slams shut behind me. The other little kid jumped out of his skin. I tried to remain calm. The other paraprofessional nearby sees us out in the hallway, peering into the empty classroom, presumably looking very puzzled and a little freaked out. She asks if the kid was in there. I said, no, but the door slammed behind me when I was walking out. I trailed off, looking down at the kiddo with me, who was looking back up at me with his eyes as wide as ever. Probably just the wind, I say. The other para kind of looks at me crazy, but shrugs it off and keeps about her business. The kid I was with, I kid you not, whispers, it was a ghost. And of course, I say, no, no, I'm sure it was just because I messed with the door. You know, the obvious. Incident blows off, a couple of weeks pass by, and I'm in the empty computer room working on art for the walls. It's Wednesday, so it's an early day for pre-K, and all of the littles have gone home, while the real teachers are in a staff meeting. Someone knocks at my office door. Mind you, the door no longer shuts all the way, so I figure they don't want to barge in. I get up from my desk five feet away and I open the door. Nobody is there. I look down the hallway and nobody is there. I go sit back down more annoyed than anything and it happens again. At this point, I'm kind of fed up. I do practice witchcraft and I've been doing so seriously for more than 16 years but I have no mediumship abilities or anything like that. I don't deal with ghosts and spirits in my practice, but that's the reason that I'm not scared at this point. I ask the janitor if the place is haunted. Man, this guy doesn't skip a beat. And he says, oh yeah, Rodney? Rodney, yeah, that little boy, he died in there. They named that doll across from the office after him, you know? What the heck? I asked my supervisor to confirm this and she said, oh yeah, no one ever told you about Rodney, huh? I'm like, yeah, well that could have been in your ad. So at this point, I've become acquaintances with the school librarian. I ask her about what's going on. She says all kinds of people have had weird experiences. Night janitors have had things move on their own. 
One time, the top principal had an alarm go off, showing somebody was down in the basement at 3 a.m. But none of the outside doors had gone off and nobody was on video in the school at the time. I guess another time over spring break, the doll across from the office got ripped up in his display case, his head laying on the ground. Which is why he has a construction paper on him now. No one on camera and nothing on the camera of the doll. Another staff member never believed in ghosts until she saw a little boy run into a classroom and then promptly disappear. That's about the extent of things that happened to me there, but I became fascinated. Some staff knew of the ghost, some had never heard anything about it. Mostly, staff who worked on my side of the building had experiences. The other side of the building seemed like a whole other world, totally normal, no ghosts over there. I became the weird ghost girl, I'm sure, always asking people if they'd seen anything. I am not the person to pretend like nothing's going on, so as not to stir the pot. No way. Of course, I'd never let the kiddos hear me. No one other than the janitor ever seemed to have heard of anybody dying at the school. But people who had heard of the ghost, or had experiences, did have their theories. One day, I asked a paraprofessional from another school in the district, because at a meeting, she mentioned that she herself had attended that elementary school where I worked. She didn't know anything about a ghost, but she did say that while she attended, a boy died at the school, in the wing, where I work. He had the flu and his heart gave out. It's actually a really very sad story that I'll just spare you, but she could corroborate. She said that they hung a drawing of him up in the hallway to commemorate him. Sure enough, among the plaques, there's this framed picture of a swimming hole and a mountain in memory of Ernie, not Rodney. I found a much better job and quit during summer vacation, but I did tell Ernie or Rodney or whoever in the silence of the computer room in the last week of school that if he wanted to, he could cross over that he didn't have to be stuck at the school. I even had a sacred place out in the country where I believe the veil is thin and that he was welcome to come there with me. Like I said, no psychic abilities here, but I did drive out there on the last day and I put down a birdhouse for Ernie. I really hope that he's doing well. So, a little backstory. I went to a special needs school for nine years, one of the Tevin schools in Denmark. The buildings are over 130 years old, and they have a lot of history, including being a tuberculosis treatment center. The basement was where all the creative things were, like paint and stonecutter tools, the library, and some other things. At the time, I was 13 to 14, I'm female, I was also very creative, and I loved to go down there after school because I could just hide in there and be myself and make things. To get there, you'd have to walk through a very loud door, go left just a little bit, and then go through another door, a glass door, and then finally the last door. You could always, always hear it when somebody was coming down there because it was just so loud. The person who was supposed to be taking care of me left, and I was alone in the basement in that room. I heard the door and everything, and them walking up the stairs. Then I heard a whisper. I couldn't hear what they were saying, but it was definitely a woman. The person who was taking care of me was a man, so it wasn't him. I looked to where I had heard the whisper, and this is where I saw a transparent woman in old-fashioned clothing. From what I could tell, it seemed like something was running down her face. When I think about it now, maybe it was blood, but it was pretty dark. We made eye contact. Surprisingly, I wasn't scared. I didn't really think about it. It was normal to see things down there. 
to hear things. I asked if she was okay, and she screamed in a way that I can't describe. Honestly, it was like a banshee. And then she just disappeared. The weird thing is, my stepdad's father passed away a little over a week later. To this day, I can't be totally sure what I saw down there. I know banshees aren't from Denmark, but that scream. It was odd and different. It wasn't like a normal scream. And them being harbingers of doom and all that, and then something bad happening later. I don't know. I'm 21 now, and I'm still as confused as I was back then. All I know is that that school was definitely haunted, because I'm not the only one who saw some things there. This story still gives me chills to this day. When I was in the fifth grade, I had my very first paranormal experience, as well as many of my classmates. Our school was known to be haunted for whatever reason, as well as the high school and the middle school. In 1991, before I was born, there was a tornado, and it was rumored that the bodies were buried all over the city which probably isn't true, but I just thought I'd mention it. I enrolled in the elementary school because I had moved and my first day was kind of rough. I could tell I probably wasn't going to fit in, but I made some great friends toward the end of the school year. We all had our own little friend groups and stayed on separate sides of the playground. But one day we were all on the playground and one of the students in my class named Kyle saw a person wandering around in the woods. He told the teacher, but she didn't believe him. So he started telling every one of our classmates, including myself, that he had seen somebody in the woods. Now, our school was surrounded by woods. Sometimes the high schoolers would smoke in the woods, but this wasn't the case. It was only a few minutes after Kyle had told everybody what he saw that the teacher would finally believe him. The look on her face. You could tell she had seen something that wasn't human. You just know that look. We weren't allowed on the playground for a couple of days after that happened for our safety. So we would have recess in the lunchroom. The teachers would bring out board games and snacks at what was supposed to be recess time. Well, during recess time, this girl named Serena walked up to me and asked me if I had seen the person in the woods. I said, no, the teacher was trying to get us all in as fast as she could, so I didn't really have time to look. After that, she sat me down and showed me a locket. I didn't really know why she was showing me a locket and how it would somehow possibly connect to the conversation until she told me that she knew the person outside and that the person had given her the locket. Serena didn't really have any friends. She was pretty lonely. During recess, she would always sit by the fence, all by herself. A few days after Serena had shown me the locket, we were finally allowed to go outside for recess again. And here comes Serena, walking toward me with the locket in her hand. She told me she was missing the locket for a day or two, but she found it over by the fence with a picture of a girl in it that looked exactly like the person that Kyle saw. Fast forward to a few months later, all of my classmates are participating in a musical at the high school. We all sit behind the curtain, waiting for our turn in the musical. Serena, myself, and some of the others were left behind. And for some reason, there's a staircase behind the curtain that leads up to a door. As we were about to go on stage for our role, we see the same girl going up the staircase, never to be seen again. I was in the same district until 10th grade, and we were constantly on that stage for many more musicals and for theater, and I never saw her again. To this day, I don't really know who she is. I just know that I don't think she was alive anymore. 
The whole thing with the locket never made sense either. I still have a lot of questions, but it was definitely weird. During my childhood, I had family who lived in Saudi Daisy, near Chattanooga, Tennessee. One of them told me a story of how, as a girl in the 1930s, she had seen the famed Black Track Ghost. When I asked her about it, she told me the story. In the early part of the last century, a beautiful young lady was forced to choose between the pampered life of a well-to-do daughter in Chattanooga and the dirty, boring life at a Saudi Daisy coal mine. She is known as a Black Track Ghost, which is so named based on the scattered coal that's found over the train tracks in the area of the mines. The young lady, who was the daughter of a local Chattanooga doctor, decided to marry a handsome clerk at the Saudi Daisy mining office. Outraged at the mismatch, the irate doctor disinherited his headstrong daughter. After a few weeks of marriage, though, the young bride apparently grew bored with life with her shantytown clerk and was instead attracted to a rough-and-tumble miner. One night, the mining office was robbed and the clerk was brutally murdered. The unfaithful bride and her miner disappeared and weren't heard from again, at least not in the usual sense. Sometime later, the body of a young, unidentified woman was discovered in a lake in an adjacent county, apparently the victim of murder herself. No connection was ever made to the runaway bride, until her image began to plague the Saudi Daisy miners. The first encounter was reported by a hardened coal miner, walking home on a bitterly cold winter's night. As the crippled man struggled up the deserted street, he became aware of somebody quickly approaching him on his right. His silent companion, with hair dripping wet and dressed only in a thin white slip, glided past him. Even though he recognized the specter, she stepped by without acknowledging him. The miner was mesmerized, noting that his breath was like a fog in the cold, dark night, while her rigid lips emitted nothing. The black track ghost visits became a common occurrence in Saudi Daisy. When she wore a long flowing white gown, local residents believed she was just wandering. But if she appeared in her gray slip, which was apparently her death shroud, she foretold doom. If she stood outside somebody's window, a fatal tragedy would befall the unfortunate homeowner. Although the Black Track Ghost is best known in Saudi Daisy, her spirit continued to echo her desire to exist in two worlds. Her father's home was near Walden's, the old Civil War hospital, located near East 8th Street and what is now Martin Luther King Boulevard. The friend that I knew said that she lived in that area as a little girl. The child witnessed the Black Track Ghost many times as she stood and looked sadly into a nearby doctor's home. When the little girl spoke of it, she was slapped and told not to tell lies, but she said that she was only telling the truth. She was just observing the sad shade of a woman who was visiting the comfort and luxury of her father's domain with the knowledge that she could never return home again. Another haunting that went hand in hand with this and occurred simultaneously happened to those living near the coal mining town. They experienced something unique. A pair of glowing eyes would appear in several of the local houses on a fairly regular basis. After a while, nobody was even alarmed. It just became accepted. A young bride got the life scared out of her after waking up to see the ghost roaming her bedroom. Folks just laughed like it was nothing out of the norm the haunting stopped sometime around the mid-50s, though, and nobody's heard from the ghost since, and nobody really knows why. Up 
I grew up in a small California desert tourist town called Joshua Tree, home of the Joshua Tree National Park. Those of us that are older call it the monument, as it was that before it was national parkdom. I was in my early 20s at the time, which was approximately 15 to 16 years ago, and I was the only one with a car and a license. Growing up in a small desert town leaves you with limited options for fun, and we would always make use of the park. Occasionally, maybe once a week or so, a group of us would pile into the station wagon with beer, smokes, and a mixtape, and drive through the park late at night. An empty road, so dark and quiet, other than the loud group of guys in a red Mercury driving fast from one entrance to the other, was just the kind of vibe we liked. Hours would go by each time as we drove along the desolate road and stopped at various rocks that we liked to climb on. I cannot overstate how desolate it was, how alone we felt. No other cars, no other lights, except the occasional lonely unmanned road work sign when warranted. That's exactly what we thought it was at first, but I'm getting ahead of myself. This trip started like every other, except maybe more of us than usual. Crammed in that car, windows down as I chain smoked and drove a good 20 miles an hour over the speed limit, gravel was spitting up as we were driving along having a great time. Shortly into the trip, I saw a light, a blue light. Possibly. It was miles and miles ahead. But that's the thing about the dark. Dark like you get out in the desert. The light can shine for miles. I remember saying something about having to slow down at some point ahead. Must be some kind of construction sign left up, I thought. Had to be a sign. The light hadn't moved. We continued for a few miles to one of our favorite stops and got out. We climbed for a while, maybe 45 minutes or so. We drank a little, we joked a lot, the norm. Then we piled back in and continued. To be very clear, this light never moved and we'd already been about an hour into our adventure. A question that I kept thinking though was, why would a sign have a blue light? It's very unusual. But we still figured it was a sign because it was so stationary. As we approached the light, I started to slow down. I slowed more and more as we approached the source. It wasn't a sign. It wasn't a car. It wasn't even a UFO. Standing on the side of the road, facing toward us, unmoving for over an hour at this point, was a man. A pale white man with a white beard, dirty old miner clothing, and an old mining helmet. He was holding a pickaxe, period appropriate for a time long before the park was anything other than desert with some lonely mines. His light was giving off this unnatural and bright blue light. His face was blank, but he stared at us, directly at all of us. We sped up, and as we drove by faster, his head turned to keep pace with us as we left. His light was visible, unmoving once again, facing us the entire trip out. It never flickered. It never moved. He wasn't translucent, but the saying as white as a ghost applied to everything about him other than his clothes, pickaxe, and light. I remember looking at the car clock shortly after passing him. It was almost exactly 1 a.m. when we passed. We never saw a car. We never saw a horse. We never saw any way for this old, sickly, pale miner to have gotten into the park. There was no reason for him to be there. Any means of transportation would have been visible, if nearby. Worst of all, we estimated that this miner had to have been standing there, facing us, for at least an hour and a half, never moving. The eeriest part, by far, 
was how still he'd been the whole time, waiting, perhaps, to see us. Not once did that light flicker, as if he looked down for a moment or turned his head. He just stood there, staring down a road at a car full of idiots. Even when we were parked, headlights off and climbing on some rocks while balancing a beer in hand, he stared from miles away into the darkness in our direction. We would have been no more than darkness to any human that far away without our headlights. We never saw him again. However, a few years ago, I decided to check to see if anybody had ever experienced something similar. I found one other story of a couple that saw him almost in the same place that we did, standing there staring down the road late at night. Then I found another story of some people who were camping out in the dark away from the standard campsites, and they saw the silhouette of what they thought was a miner walking by very close to them. I wish we would have stopped. Even if it would have been the most horrifying thing ever, I wish we would have stopped because I honestly believe there was a ghost of a dead miner out in that park. And I would know for sure today. I wouldn't have so many questions. There are plenty of unexplained things that I've encountered in my life. But the visage of the miner still sits fresh to this day. Back in 2019, my girlfriend and I went on a vacation to an island in Italy. Everything went well, except that the last day it did rain a little bit. It didn't rain a lot though. The streets were dry, but the sky was gray, and we came back to our little house at about 5 p.m. because of the weather. We got bored pretty quickly, and we had to wait at least three or four hours before going to eat at a restaurant. So I decided to visit the only part of the island I hadn't seen. We got on the motorbike and went to Calafante, which I found out was totally abandoned due to a collapse that had happened in 2017. The whole neighborhood was as neglected and deserted as the beach and the restaurant were. And I swear we passed through every house, road, or parking lot. And it was just deserted. Nobody lived there. Not even a tourist or a car. I think that the collapse of the beach made that spot a little bit less interesting. Anyway, I kept driving in that neighborhood until I ended up at a dead-end street near a football field. But there were two kids playing football on the end of the street, and people noticed that every house nearby was shut close. Not a single sign of a human being for kilometers, so where did these two kids come from? We got close, and my girlfriend and I were already a little bit freaked out. But I wanted to talk to them, because if I remember correctly, I was looking for a place that I couldn't find, and I thought perhaps they would know where it was. We approached them. They were no more than six or seven years old, dirty as hell like just came out of a coal mine dirty. One kid had a white, more like a gray, dirty and torn t-shirt, and the other only had his rag-like pants on. Both of them were without shoes and with their hair completely shaved. The shirtless kid had a circular wound, more like a hole right in the middle of his pectorals. It was red, bloody, and new like he had just been shot in the middle of the chest. I asked them this thing and they answered me, but I couldn't understand a thing. It wasn't like the local dialect or any Italian dialect at all. It was completely incomprehensible. They kept talking and pointing at my bike. We couldn't understand a thing, so we just said goodbye and made a U-turn. I could see them staring at us from my mirrors. We were so freaked out. They looked pretty injured, but they were acting super casual. I don't know why, but my girlfriend and I are pretty sure they were some kind of ghost. Like maybe kids that died in the World War or something like that. I don't know if it's a proper paranormal encounter, 
but it's the only story that I still can't explain. When I was 8 to 10 years old in the mid-1990s, my mom worked at a carpet company near Beaufort, Georgia. The building had a storefront where customers could walk through and look at the samples. And in the back, there was a huge warehouse where all kinds of flooring was stored. There was a loading and unloading area with large bay doors that opened up to a concrete loading lot. The loading lot was against an overgrown wooded area, but the area still had rural housing dotted here and there. So you could see the backs of a few houses a bit of ways through the woods. In general, the building always gave me the creeps. I would run around the huge hanging carpets in the warehouse while my mom was working up front. One day, while I was waiting for my mom to get off work, the big bay doors were opened, so I went out in the loading area to play outside. After a few minutes, I heard what sounded like a train coming down the tracks. Of course, when you're a kid, you get really excited about that stuff. So I ran out a little farther into the loading lot. Sure enough, I heard a train horn and I could see a train coming down the tracks from the right of the building. I put my hands over my eyes to shield them from the sun so I could see better. And I watched this robin egg blue, shiny metal train coming down the track. I remember seeing a lot of rivets at the time I called them screws because I didn't know what rivets were, on the train and windows that came down, not up. Specifically, I saw people sitting in it and especially a lot of ladies with these kind of round looking hats and a kid running down the middle of the train car. I saw a man smoking a pipe and I remembered thinking, must be in the smoking section. To give you a better idea, the train front was rounded and the cars were rectangular. The robin egg blue was in some details, like one of the panels under each window, stripes going up the front, and a few other small areas. The rest was really shiny, like metal. It seemed like one long train, because the cars were attached really close together. I watched this train pass by, and I was really excited about it. It seemed like my mom came out almost right after it passed to tell me she was ready to leave. I said, I saw the train, it just passed by. She was really confused and told me that there were no trains that passed there. I lamented that there most definitely was a train and I told her everything about it. She said, there's no train that can even come back here. The train tracks end right down there. I seriously thought she was pulling my leg, so I laughed and I said, uh-uh. I ran down there and, sure enough, the train track ran out of track just around a bend that wasn't visible from the lot. I swore to her that I had just seen the train pass by, and she swore, of course, that I was making it up. As I thought about it, I couldn't really say that I saw any specific facial features of the people on the train though. I remembered the hats, the kid, the pipe smoking, but I couldn't remember what a single face looked like. I kind of dropped it because yeah, the tracks clearly ended and a train couldn't have gone through. But I brought it up to her and explained the detail of the train again in recent years. She thought I had made it up and couldn't believe the details. But I remember all these years later, and I think she kind of got spooked by it because she finally admitted that she also felt creepy in that building sometimes. I honestly don't know how to put this or where to begin, and now that I think of it, I don't know who would believe this, but it's true. 
This happened two years ago when I enlisted into the Army, and I did my basic training at Fort Benning, Georgia. At the beginning of the cycle, it seemed normal. Nothing out of the ordinary until white phase had started. I will only share four experiences to avoid this being too long, so hopefully you at least enjoy the stories. Whether or not you believe me is up to you. Experience 1 One day, I was a battle buddy for one of my friends who had passed out due to the heat, so he had to stay at the bay for a little while. We were on the other end of the bay that has 55 bunks in it. My roster number was 340, and he was 342. So we were sitting by our bunks, talking about random stuff, when out of the blue, one of the locks on the 301's locker jingled out of nowhere. Now keep in mind, we're the only ones in the bay, let alone the entire company area, because the others are out training. We stop what we're talking about, and he asks me to go check it out. I say no, so we check under the bunks and nobody's there. Experience 2 The second incident happened one night when I woke up at about 1 in the morning. I slept on the bottom bunk, and the way that I slept had my head facing the middle of the bay. In front of our bunks was a blue tape line, where we would have to line up for different purposes. So I woke up and looked toward the middle, and I thought I saw outlines of people walking back and forth. At least four or five people passed my bunk, or so I thought. I hopped up and threw on my boots and began to tow the line. Then the fire guard came up to me and asked me what I was doing. When I told him what I saw, he said that there was nobody else awake and I should get some sleep. Experience 3 This incident happened a few nights after the second one. Again, I woke up at about 1 o'clock in the morning, but this time it was different. I didn't see anybody walking around. Instead, I physically saw a shadow figure sitting at the edge of my bunk. I knew it wasn't one of the others because it was pitch dark the shadow, I mean. The figure was darker than dark. I just kind of froze up and tried getting the attention of the guy next to me, but he wasn't having it. Eventually, the figure faded away right in front of me, but it was still pretty creepy. This last experience, I'll tell you, isn't too serious, but it's still weird. One day I was in the latrine and I was shaving and getting ready for the day before anyone else had woken up. Then, randomly, all the paper towel machines, which are motion activated, went off one by one. I checked to see if anybody had come in, but I knew nobody did. I would have heard the door and footsteps, but I was just trying to convince myself that there was some kind of an explanation. These are four of the weird and creepy things that happened to me at Basic. For disclosure, I'm not crazy and I also don't know how to explain any of this. I mainly give credit to it most likely being the stress getting to me. I'm not the only one who had experiences though. These are just mine. Even the drill sergeants had experiences of their own that they told us. So are there ghost recruits wandering around the training areas? Maybe. My husband and I met a guy who used to work in our house. In conversation one day, he said, so have you met the ghosts yet? My husband started laughing and said, we sure have. We were a little bit skeptical as to whether we'd imagined the things that happened, but laborers working here have been very unsettled by some events, and in some cases, they've refused to come back. We've always lived in houses where strange things happen but this one has really been a wild ride. It's very haunted. Noises, floorboards creaking with footsteps, bangs, doors opening, lights and sockets switching on and off, things moving, voices, shadows, it's crazy. He also told us some of the things that happened here. It's a very old house, and in recent years it was a home for addicts with new babies. 
A lot of serious, horrific trauma happened here. I cried when he told us about it. It's unsurprising to me, therefore, that the energy here is so charged. Knowing this, I thought that over the weekend I might light some candles and sage the house, and invite anything to leave that needs to go, though I suppose some will probably want to stay. I'd be interested to know what you would do here. Our family and friends have said to move out, but we like it here. We don't have any bad experiences, really. We're not frightened. And, as far as advice goes, I don't really want any advice on exorcisms or fleeing the house. The worst thing we've ever experienced was a disembodied groaning noise. It was very human and very strange. But if it was intended to frighten us, it didn't. I raised my eyebrows at my husband and then carried on working. Last night, my husband and I opened doors and windows all throughout the house. We started in the cellar and worked our way up through the house. There are 28 rooms or spaces, so it took us ages. I used white sage sticks, tea light candles, and a bowl each to carry the candles in, which were gifts from loved ones and sentimental to us. As we moved through the house, I just talked, asking any spirits who didn't respect us or wanted to harm us to leave our house, that this was our home and we wouldn't tolerate it and that if anybody wished to stay, they could, but they had to respect us and treat us with kindness and we would do the same. In the rooms where we felt the most oppressive energy, one bedroom in particular, I spent a while talking out loud to any spirits trapped here because of the traumatic house history. I said that they were free to move on now and to go and find their loved ones. Who knows if it did anything, but I felt like we had to try, so I did it with belief and conviction. My husband had a strange interaction in the cellar where the sage was knocked from his hand, but he remained firm and told them that they had to leave and they weren't allowed to touch him. Our cat was avidly watching the house spirit cat as usual and following it around. And then he seemed to be watching and following things with his eyes through the kitchen to the back door. We were just watching, fascinated. I said thank you, just in case they were leaving, so we'll see if things get better. We'll see if they seem more peaceful. I certainly slept very well last night, so fingers crossed. My family and I moved to Colorado when I was eight, so around 1997. We lived with my brother and his family for a while until my parents found a more permanent place to settle. We had a few terrifying experiences in this house. The short version is that his basement was almost certainly home to something very bad. But these are my stories about some of the experiences in the house that we moved into after leaving my brother's. I will give you as brief a description of the place as I can. My parents found this house almost in the middle of nowhere. Unfortunately, it is now surrounded by new housing developments and stores. But when we first moved in, there were just fields for miles and miles, and we had a gorgeous, jaw-dropping view of the Rockies. The land left adjacent to our property was Rocky Flats, the place where they stored nuclear reactors and who knows what else, underground for years and years. They claim it's all cleaned up now, but we still get dragonflies bigger than my head in spring. And once I even saw a two-headed bull snake in the backyard. Anyway, my parents got a good deal on rent and the landlord was fairly agreeable. To an outsider though, the living arrangements probably seemed strange. Our landlord was basically renting out his basement but the house functioned like an apartment building. We had our own entrances and our own driveway and garage, but we shared the mailbox and address. The main drive into the top portion of the house was a huge circle that branched off on either side going downhill into our section of drive and house. On your way down, you would pass this little brick building with a glass window 
and a very old, very visible toilet and a bunch of junk. It read General Store on the front. When my parents inquired about this strange setup, the landlord said that the whole property used to be a gas station a long time ago, when the highway that ran in front of the house was the only way into the mountains. Later, the big hill eroded a bit from the weather, and we found an old tank and bucket stuck in the hillside, corroborating the story. The rest of the area was farmland. A steep drop below us behind the house was a horse stable, and beyond that, a pasture, where a farmer would rotate Angus cattle throughout the year. All of this is just to give you a sense of the area. We were literally surrounded by nothing, and sometimes it was a bit terrifying, albeit beautiful. First experience. One of my first nights sleeping in the house, I had a very vivid dream. As a kid, I never really had vivid dreams, so this was something entirely new to me. I remember walking out of my room in my dream and coming directly into the living room. My mother was sitting in her chair staring at the TV, but there was a circle of people standing right in the middle of the room. People I didn't recognize and who didn't register me being there. They were looking at something on the floor in the middle of the circle. When I squeezed past them, I realized they were looking at a woman, lying on the floor, presumably dead. She was wearing a long, mauve-colored Victorian-style dress, and her blonde hair was long and covered her face. I say she was dead because she wasn't moving, and a good chunk of her dress was visibly stained with blood. The most chilling part of this experience, however, was that her body was floating about four to five inches off the floor. When I noticed this detail, I also noticed that the people around her were chanting. As soon as I noted these two things, I woke up. Second experience. This one will forever give me chills when I think about it, and I will never forget it. I don't remember how long we had lived there at this point. I remember it being a normal night. My parents had gone to bed and I was tucking myself in. I don't remember dreaming about anything else that night. And if my memory serves me right, I had fallen asleep instantly and went right into this experience. I'm laying in bed, eyes closed. I can feel my body is asleep, but my mind is awake. I feel eyes on me. I open my eyes and see myself floating above me, staring down at me in bed. Then out of my periphery, I notice another me crouched in the entrance of my walk-in closet, also staring at me. Both of the me's had glowing red eyes. I remember wanting to scream, and when I closed my eyes to do so, I opened them again, and now was on the ceiling staring down into my bed. Bed me was still there, but it too had glowing red eyes. Closet me was also still there. They were both staring up at me. I screamed in silence. They began to grin wider than any human should be able to. And then I fell. I woke up in that instance for real, drenched in sweat, still in my bed, feeling like I was going to vomit. I didn't sleep the rest of the night, and I've struggled with terrible insomnia ever since. Third experience. Remember the cattle herd that I mentioned earlier? Well, I'm pretty sure they were mutilated. My dad used to look out our back door with binoculars, just to watch scenery and spy on distant neighbors. One day, I came home from school, and he hands me the binoculars and says, Look at the cow pasture. Tell me what you see. It took me a minute to center on the right area, but once I did, my jaw dropped. The field, which usually housed about 50 head of Black Angus cattle, was completely empty, save for two black lumps on the ground. Ever since we moved there, that field had never been empty. We couldn't see properly that far away, so that night my dad and I crept down the hill with some flashlights to get a closer look. The two lumps turned out to be two cows, no heads, legs, or tails and the torsos that were left were completely hollowed out. 
It wasn't like something had killed them and then snacked on them over time. No. We had coyotes come through all the time. We knew what that looked like. And also, these coyotes avoided these carcasses like the plague. They didn't smell. There was no blood or viscera. And the cuts were surgical. Everything about it made us creeped out. The farmer that owned that chunk of land never came back with the rest of his cattle, and eventually a for sale sign was erected after the bodies had rotted away into nothing. Those are three of the experiences I remember best from that place. Don't get me wrong, it definitely had its beautiful moments scenery-wise, but living on what was previously known as Rocky Flats was definitely weird, to say the least. When I was growing up, there was enough family drama to want to scream. I spent most of my teenage years living with my older sister and her husband. She lives in a really old house in the downtown area in a city in Texas. Now this old house looked like it was about to collapse, even to this day, and I'm in my late 20s. It all started when I first began staying with her. Her son, when he would visit, stayed in the guest room so I just had a habit of sleeping on the couch because the room was typically taken. We had a long night of movies, snacks, and staying up, as siblings do, and she eventually went to bed. I remember slowly drifting off, and just as I was about to give in to the comforting lull of sleep, there was an intense feeling that somebody was watching me. Now, downtown isn't known for being safe. I was hoping that I wouldn't look toward her window and see a face looking in to rob the place. I didn't, but instead I was greeted with a short, pale boy with no eyes. He wore old clothes. They looked to be 20th century. The overalls and everything, like a little house on the prairie vibe. He had dark hair and literally black holes where his eyes should have been. I'll never forget the wave of sadness that hit me. I began to cry. I can't even say that I felt fear. It was like I was thrown into a deep, instant depression. Finally, I was able to call for my sister. The boy continued to stare until she turned on the light. She refused to believe me that night. I was so insistent. Later, other things began to happen, and she started to see what I meant. Little things, such as cabinets opening and closing in the middle of the day, doors opening and closing, running through the halls, the back gate being left open. Thankfully, the dog stayed home. One night, we heard knocking on the door to the backyard. We always used that door because the front door and side door weren't over by the garage, so it was just easier. Expecting her husband, who worked the night shift, to be coming for his lunch, she opened the door and screamed. He was there, standing in the doorway and just staring, as he did before. She also began to cry. That's when it got worse. The doors and cabinets opened and closed all day and night. You'd feel somebody sit on the bed or the couch with you. Eventually, I took over the guest room until her son came to visit. I couldn't even face outward toward the mirror. Everything told me not to. So, I would face the wall until I would almost fall asleep and then feel somebody sit on the bed with my sister, dead asleep. I knew it wasn't her. She also started seeing him, standing in her driveway, staring out into traffic all day or night until somebody would drive up. The boy started showing up everywhere. The last two times we came into contact with him were the worst. One happened when we got back pretty late from Walmart. We had a spur of the moment, midnight Walmart trip. We bought some groceries and food for all the pets and came home. She stepped out into the garage, 
and all we heard were deafening screams. I looked over to see my sister also screaming as a handprint formed on her wrist and she dropped the groceries. We left them until morning we were so scared. The last and final time was, unfortunately, all for me. My sister worked at a World War II museum that was just a couple of blocks away, and I volunteered there. That was also haunted beyond belief, but that's a long story for another day. Anyway, she came to pick me up, since I wanted to sleep in on my weekend. I went after lunch to help clean up the place. She said that was fine by her, but just asked me to be quiet because her husband had just come home and she didn't want me to wake him. I knew the drill. Drink some coffee, hang out, and text some friends. I paused because I heard the shower running in their bedroom. John never showered with me in there. So I peeked down the hallway, which had a direct view of their room. John was passed out. He wasn't even awake. I stood there for a moment, confused. Then I heard the running and screams. Directly in front of me, I hear, Daddy, no, please. I was then pushed right into the door to the outdoor garage and a whisper that said, help me, right in my ear. I bailed. I ran outside just as my sister drove into the driveway under the garage. We never saw or heard him again. She says it's been peaceful ever since I left her house. He's never shown himself again. She has a huge hole under her house where animals go all the time. I'm guessing that's where he is. And he showed me how he died that morning. I can say that I hope that he's at peace and whatever happened to him never gets shown to anyone else again. middle school teacher and coach in a rural area outside of San Antonio, Texas. As a part of my coaching contract, I have to get my CDL and bus my athletes to and from games. After our last game of the volleyball season, I was driving the bus back to the bus barn. It was around 9.30 or 10 o'clock at night, so it was already super dark and there weren't many cars out but I've driven this part a million times and I was just excited to return the bus and get home to my husband and dogs. The bus I had wasn't anything special. It was just an old sub bus from 2004. There are cameras inside that don't record audio, apparently, and a few switches were broken. But as long as the brakes worked and the bus got as close to 50 miles per hour as it could, it was perfect. I was approaching a bridge when a whispering voice began to speak through the radio. This didn't surprise me much because there's usually an interference near this bridge due to it being near the train tracks. Plus lots of cops hide here to catch speeders. I wasn't really familiar with the way these radios worked, but it helped me feel better about it. The closer I got to the bridge though, the louder the whisper through the radio was. I began to make out words like slow, sit, and no. As soon as I started to go underneath the bridge, I did a mirror check just to make sure I had enough room on the sides. Everything seemed normal until I looked in the inside mirror that could see all of the seats behind me. Sitting in the very back row on my right was a figure. It was pure black just a black abyss sitting straight up in the seat as if it was one of my athletes. At first I thought it was a shadow, but as the bus moved, it stayed put, unlike the shadows around it. After about five seconds, as I pulled away from the bridge, the figure vanished. The voice on the radio had paused, but then I clearly heard it say in a static low voice, turn around. I snapped my eyes forward, terrified, and pressed the gas a little harder, 
praying that I could get this old bus to go faster. The bus barn gate was open and about 50 yards away, and I only stopped when I parked the bus. I did a quick sweep of the inside to make sure that nobody had stowed away and that this was some kind of prank, but there was nothing out of the ordinary. I asked the other coaches the next day if they had ever had any weird experiences around the bridge, but they said no. I'm going to ask the coaches at the other schools as well. I did get a chance to tell this story to one of the bus drivers that I get to see most mornings during the AM drop-off. He's an older driver who's been around since 2001. He mentioned that gangs used to race down that stretch of road all the time back in the early 2000s. One day, a race ended in a fiery crash just before the bridge, and a young man lost his life. The bus driver had heard similar stories to mine about the radio near the bridge, but never had anybody said that they had seen an apparition before. I asked if he knew of somebody I could contact to see the footage from the camera on the bus, but he laughed and said that they would probably think I was crazy and drug test me on the spot. This was the scariest experience I've ever had driving a bus. I pass that bridge every day on the way to work, and it just gives me chills. I don't have to drive a bus again for another three months, but I'm already dreading it. I worked the late shift for this company about six years ago. I would get off at midnight and the company bus would take us home. My neighborhood was the farthest, so I would be brought home last. I should also mention that the road that this happened on has had multiple strange incidents. Accidents, murders, ghostly sightings, strange creatures, just a whole lot of weird stuff. On the last part of the journey, there were three of us left on the bus. After the driver confirmed our addresses, we continued. I was at the front of the bus. A young lady in the middle and a guy at the back were the other two passengers. We got to the guy's street and the driver stopped and waited for him to get off. After getting impatient, the driver asked the lady to go check if he was sleeping. She came running back to the front of the bus, crying and praying. We asked her what was wrong, and she said that there was nobody back there, and she wanted to go home right now. The driver switched on the lights and floored it. It gets even creepier. After getting off on my street, I began to walk to my house. This was now at about two o'clock in the morning. Every dog that I would walk past kept staring at something behind me. When I turned to look, there was nothing. There was no shadow, no sound, no body. After getting inside my house, I looked out the window for the next 10 minutes. It was just dead silence and dogs staring at nothing. I've never been able to figure out what happened that night, but it was freaky. My friend and I worked construction, and one night we were enjoying a break, just hanging out together. We had another friend with us, we'll call her Jen. My other construction friend we'll call Maggie. So Maggie and I were talking about some of the strange things that we've seen in houses. And Jen goes, hang on, my mom has the craziest story, let me call her. So Jen calls her mom, and her mom begins to tell us this story of what keeps happening in her attic. Her mom goes, it's the darndest thing, but you know the light cord, the thing you pull to turn it on and off? It keeps tying itself into a knot with a circle hanging down from it. Never have been able to figure that out. As we're listening to the story, Maggie and I look at each other 
and our eyes say everything. We're both thinking about the same project that we worked on not that long ago, maybe a couple years. Hey, whereabouts is your house? Maggie asks. Jen's mom tells us, and we about freaked out. After Jen hung up the phone, she asks us what we're freaking out about. I finally got the words together to say, your mom's house was a construction site we worked on not long before you guys moved in. It needed some work after the previous owner left, I suppose. The thing is, she unalived herself in the attic by hanging herself from the light cord, using it as a noose. That was one of the strangest things we'd ever encountered. However, I was working on a site one time that was a full-on demo. It was this old, decrepit mansion in Maine. Well, as we're working, we found this old, dusty VHS tape in the wall. Obviously, we were curious, so we put it into a barely functioning VHS player to see what was on it. All it contained was several minutes of an old woman sitting in a chair in the middle of the basement, staring directly into the camera and breathing heavily. And then it cut off. Redditor Psychological Ant 8611 posted a story that happened to him on a hiking expedition. Here it is. As a young man, I loved to climb mountains. This is an amazing encounter that occurred to me on one climbing expedition. We had left a hut late one night. The intention was to summit a mountain in a single long push by climbing right through the night. It was bad weather in the middle of winter and there was deep snow we were trying to find our way through a maze of crevasses on a glacier. I remember the howling winds and clouds moving rapidly through the sky as the bulk of the mountain loomed over us. There was a full moon, which would hide behind the clouds before emerging again. I remember seeing a man moving up the slope from below us. The first thing that struck me was that he didn't have a headlamp on. I yelled over the wind at my climbing partner, Let's go talk to this guy. What guy? He shouted back. That guy, I said, pointing down at the figure moving toward us. There was a pause. What guy? At this point, I remember losing it. That freaking guy right there. He's right there. And at that point, I looked back down to see absolutely nothing. Thinking he had fallen into a crevasse, we walked down, but we never found any tracks. There was no trace of anyone. In the years since, I have heard reports of similar encounters in that area. In fact, recently, the bones of a deceased climber from the 1970s were discovered, melted out of the ice. The news report reminded me of my mysterious climber from that night, and it just makes me wonder. For our next story, Redditor The Odd News shares a fascinating tale about a coal mine and the ghost he encountered within it. Here's the story. I was born in 1968. I am the son of a miner, a father, and a miner myself. I'm the father of two children. The incident happened to me in the mine where I worked a year or two before I retired. Everything started after an accident in the mine. That day, I went to the workplace as usual. In the morning, after having breakfast in the canteen, I got into the cage to go 260 meters underground. When I say cage, I mean an elevator. We mine workers preferred to call it a cage instead of an elevator because it was a simple device that worked with a large crane rather than a true elevator. Anyway, I went down to the mine. 
After working until the end of the shift, I started walking toward the bottom of the shaft. We call the place where we get into the cage the bottom of the shaft. As I was walking slowly, an engine passed by me quickly. What we called an engine can be considered to be a small train. It was a relatively simple device compared to the train, pulling only wagons weighing up to one ton at most. There were workers on the engine. Normally, they are forbidden to do this, but sometimes when the workers are very tired after work, they ride on the engine to avoid walking. I continued to walk slowly as the engine sped past me. Then, there was shouting coming from up ahead. Someone seemed to be moaning in a wheezing voice. I moved toward the direction of the sound in order to understand exactly what was happening. I started to look around carefully. When I approached the place where the sound was coming from, I saw that somebody was lying in the water channel on the side of the air door. Blood was flowing from the person, like from a faucet. At that moment, I went into like a short-term shock. In that chaos, we immediately carried the injured person to the lift entrance, that bottom of the shaft, and sent him to the hospital. I still couldn't get over the shock of that image. That day, the person that was injured in that accident died. This incident affected me deeply. My psychology was turned upside down. According to what I learned later, the accident happened as follows. While the workers were traveling with the engine, the air door did not open. Since the engine was also fast, the engine hit the door with great violence. The worker who was caught between the engine and the door was crushed badly during the impact. In the days following this incident, when I passed through that gate, it always seemed to me as if somebody was still lying in that water channel. I couldn't pass through there by myself. Since the hearth was not sufficiently lit, it was always very dark inside there. It was only illuminated by fluorescent lamps, which were very sparsely placed in certain parts of the hearth. Because of the effect of this incident, I was completely disenchanted with work. I didn't feel like going to work at all, but I had to. Anyway, one day when I was at work again, I was the last one left at the end of the work in the area of the mine where we were all working in. When I looked around, everybody had left. I sat down somewhere. Such a weight fell on me that it seemed like a lifetime to go from there to the lift area. I said to myself, I'll just rest a little where I'm sitting and then I'll go. My eyes closed for a while. I was between sleep and wakefulness. I saw a man approaching me from up ahead, holding a lamp in his hand. There's no work left at the stove at this hour. I guess he stayed later, like me, I said to myself. That light that was approaching suddenly disappeared. Oh my gosh, where did this man go, I thought. Then I just thought, let me sit for one or two more minutes. Maybe the man who just disappeared will come back and we can go to the lift together. Then my eyes closed again. I don't know how much time passed, but suddenly I woke up with a very severe slap. But what a slap. I thought my neck was broken. I immediately recovered and looked around me. There was no one. It was impossible for somebody to hit me and run away and me not see them. For this reason, I started running toward the lift in fear and panic. That day, I didn't tell anybody about what happened. One or two weeks later, I was the last one again. This time, I hurried up and went straight to the lift entrance. As I sat down and waited for the lift to arrive, I noticed that something jet black was coming toward me. It had a hand lamp and a hard hat, but neither of them was lit. It was slowly approaching me. I called out, Master, what's wrong? Did the lamp malfunction? He didn't answer. Instead, it just kept coming toward me slowly. I felt such a strong sense of fear, and I didn't know why. I wanted to get up and leave. I even wanted to run away, but I was paralyzed. I couldn't move. Although he was very close to me, I couldn't see his face or body clearly. It was as if the man coming toward me was not a tangible substance, but a shadow, a silhouette. 
Don't ever sleep on the hearth again, he said to me. I could feel the man's speech, not in my ears, but in my brain. He spoke to me almost telepathically, and then he disappeared. I had heard of such events from a few other people before, but I never believed it. At that moment, all those stories that I had heard went through my mind. I read all the prayers I knew. That black silhouette had not harmed me, but living that moment had further disrupted my already broken psychology. I couldn't get up from where I was sitting for another one to two minutes. After a while, I pulled myself together and walked away from there. When I told my friends what had happened to me, they didn't believe me. When I told what had happened to me to the imam of the village where I lived, the imam did believe me and said the following. They are the owners of the mines. As you know, according to Islamic belief, the souls of martyrs can choose to stay in this world instead of going to the hereafter if they wish. According to a saying of the Islamic prophet Muhammad, those who die under the rubble are considered martyrs, just like those who die in war. That's why we call people who died in the mines, mine martyrs. Most probably, that thing you saw in the mine was the spirit of a mine martyr, and it warned you. He wanted to protect you. After my visit to the Imam, and after that day, I never slept in the mine again. Redditor Arctic Fox of the North came to the Ghost Stories subreddit to tell not one, but three ghostly tales. Let's hear what happened. So I've wanted somewhere to share my experiences, and figured here was as good as any. My encounters with ghosts have all been pretty short, so far, so I thought I'd just put them all into one story. To this day, I'm convinced that my workplace is haunted. I had my first encounter while at work one evening. It was a little late, and a co-worker and I were staying behind to clean up after the others had left for the day, which is something we regularly do. I was going about my business and cleaning up, but when we were done and heading back to the sluice, my co-worker and best friend noticed that I had a pretty large oil stain in the shape of a handprint on my upper back. At first, I was suspicious of my coworker, thinking that she had placed her hand on my back, but we later compared her hand to the one that was on my clothing, and her hand was way too small. Thinking back on it, I had never felt anybody put their hand on my back while I was working. That and the stain was so visible that if somebody had actually put their hand on my back, they would have needed to keep it there for a while and while I was moving around. I find this pretty freaky, and I still have no clue where it came from or how it got there. My second, and most recent encounter, happened two days ago. The weather was pretty bad and the power ended up going out, halting production. The foreman and assistant foreman told us to go wait in the sluice, but it got a bit crowded so we eventually shuffled into the cafeteria. My best friend and I were made to go clean up like usual, but since it was almost pitch black, we couldn't see anything, and thus we only finished off with all the machines the best we could. When we got back into the sluice, we both saw somebody standing by the racks where we would usually hang our work clothes, but when we got around the corner and out from behind one of the shoe racks, there was nobody there. We looked into the foreman's office that's attached to the stairwell, and looked into the other sluice, which is right beside the one we use, but no one was there. The weirdest part is that we both saw two different ghosts. I saw a short and stubby figure, while my best friend saw a tall and lanky one. By far the weirdest experience that I've ever had. But the other one happened a while ago. I was visiting my best friend, and we were watching The Conjuring as you do. She had turned on some candles for some ambiance. Well, while we were watching the movie, one of the candles she lit 
almost went out, while the other one was standing perfectly still. What I find scary is that the candle only moved whenever something happened on screen. This candle was on a shelf, mind you. I got so creeped out that I eventually just blew out the candle. Something I should note is that my best friend has an attachment, her words, not mine, and now I'm pretty sure something has latched onto me as well. Her house has this old sword that she says has the souls of all of its victims trapped inside, even the original owner of the sword. She's experienced way more spooky things than I have, so I suppose she has more authority on this particular subject. Nevertheless, it's kind of scary, even though she always assures me that the ghosts at her home aren't harmful, but they do like to mess around. Somehow, that's less than comforting. This is a pretty tame story compared to some other things I've heard, but I think about these experiences all the time, so I thought I'd share them. My husband and I own our home. It's fairly new, built in 2006, and only one couple has lived in it before us. As far as I know, nothing bad has ever happened here. The first experience was when I was home alone with my children. My youngest was asleep, and my oldest was coloring at the table in the kitchen. It was the middle of the day, so the windows are open and no lights are turned on. I'm in the kitchen putting away dishes, crouched down to put a pot under the bottom cabinet, when I hear the click of the light switch and the kitchen lights turn on. I turn around fully expecting my husband to be home. He isn't. Creepy, but no big deal. Months later, both of my kids are in the nursery while I'm taking laundry out of the dryer. Even though I can see into the nursery, I can't see my kids because they're playing near the bed, which is against the wall. I hear my son jumping on the bed, and I keep telling him, don't jump on the bed, be careful of your sister. I do this a few times until I get a little frustrated, and I say, don't jump, in the classic parent tone. Directly in my ear, I hear a man's voice in a loud whisper say, don't jump. I immediately dropped the clothes and ran into the room, but of course, no one was there except my kids. A week after that, I walk next to our closet to see all of my husband's hangers swaying back and forth. I never feel threatened or nervous in my home, except for when these instances happen. I tell my husband about them, and he says he sees weird things all the time, but never tells me because he doesn't want to upset me. So yeah, I kind of hate it. I don't have many memories of my father because he died when I was just eight years old. However, I do clearly remember the night several years later when he let us know that he was still around and watching over us. First of all, you need to know something about my father. He was fascinated by the supernatural and by the possibility of some sort of existence after death. After it became clear that he would soon lose his battle with lymphatic cancer, he told my mother not to worry. He said, if there's any way for me to reappear after I die, to let you know that I'm okay, then that's what I'm going to do. I'll visit you and the kids all the time. It's gonna be so cool. My mother said her response to that was a pointed and succinct, don't you effing dare. It wasn't that she didn't care what happened to him after he died, or that she didn't want him watching over us. She just knew that she wasn't going to be able to emotionally deal with that situation, and she promised him that that's how she would react. My father followed through on his promise. The story my mother told us was that she was in their upstairs bedroom a few months after his death, 
thinking about him and crying because she missed him so much. Then she suddenly had the distinct feeling that she was being watched. She turned her head and saw my father standing outside the bedroom window on the balcony, clear as day. He looked healthy and alive. He was wearing a bright blue suit and gave my mother a look that said, is it okay if I come inside? My mother said she stared at him for a moment in total shock. She deliberately blinked her eyes to make certain that she was really seeing what she was seeing. And when she opened her eyes, he was still there, smiling and waiting. That's when my mother followed through on her promise. She closed her eyes tightly and said out loud, I can't handle this. I'm sorry, but I need you to go away. And please don't ever do this again. After about 10 seconds, she opened her eyes and this time he was gone. This next part of the story takes place a few years later and I kind of have to set the scene for you. I took a bad fall while playing soccer and the impact totally destroyed my shoulder. I broke it in two places and every ligament and tendon was torn. The reason that this is important to the story is that my shoulder hurt so bad I couldn't easily walk up the stairs to my bedroom, which was across the hall from my parents' bedroom. I was temporarily sleeping in the guest bedroom downstairs, and my brother had the bedroom we shared all to himself. That bedroom was right above the guest bedroom. In the hallway outside the guest bedroom, there was a sideboard with shelves on top and drawers below and on those shelves was an old mantel clock. It looked a lot like somebody cut off the very top part of a typical grandfather clock, and it was small enough to fit neatly on the shelf. The clock had to be wound every so often with a special key, which was kept in one of the drawers below. And when it was properly wound, the small pendulum would swing back and forth to keep the clock going. My dad loved this clock. And while he was alive, he made sure to wind it so that it never stopped. After his death, though, my mother never wound the clock again, and it eventually did stop. So this clock had been completely silent for years. Late one night, I was trying to go to sleep, but the pain of my injured shoulder was terrible, and it was keeping me awake. Plus, as a kid, I had terrible anxiety. Even with the bedroom door closed to help me feel more secure, I wasn't comfortable sleeping in the unfamiliar surroundings of the guest bedroom and being the only person downstairs. Just as I was finally feeling like I might be able to sleep, I heard something in the hallway outside the bedroom door. I was immediately freaked out and wide awake because my mother and brother were still upstairs. The stairs in this house were very squeaky and I knew for a fact that I had not heard anybody walking down them. It sounded as though someone or something was messing around with the sideboard. First, I heard a drawer open and then shut. After that, I heard a loud click, followed by a strange sort of grinding sound. Then there were a couple of more clicks. And suddenly, the clock that hadn't made a sound in years started ticking. That sound I heard before wasn't grinding. It was winding. Someone took the key out of the drawer, opened the clock, wound it, and started the pendulum. Apparently, they also put the key back in the drawer where it belonged, because that's where we found it later. At this point, 11-year-old me was not only wide awake, but I was also scared as hell, and hiding as far beneath my covers as I could go with a broken shoulder. After all, when you're a child, covers are magical and repel all things evil, right? The next thing I heard was somebody walking up the stairs. Then everything was quiet for a short while. Soon though, I heard footsteps moving around all over the upstairs. I even heard someone directly above me open and close the creaky sliding closet doors in my bedroom. After that, I clearly heard footsteps come down the stairs, someone open and then close the door to the guest room where I was struggling to breathe inside my cover cave. And then soon after, the footsteps returned up the stairs. And finally, all was silent, except for one thing. The clock continued with its relentless tick-tock, tick-tock.
talk. Eventually, sleep caught up with me, and I didn't wake until my mother came to check on me in the morning. While we were eating breakfast that morning, my mother looked at me and paused for a long time. Finally, she asked, were you up and walking around last night? I told her I was not, and then I described to her all the noises I had heard. My mother told me she heard noises during the night too, and had searched all over the house to see who it was. It was her walking all around upstairs, opening and closing the squeaky closet, coming down the stairs, opening and closing the guest bedroom door, and then going back up. So who made the other sounds we both heard first, we wondered. And why was that clock ticking? Suddenly my mother's eyes grew wide. Oh my goodness, she said. Last night was the anniversary of the night your dad died. I think it must have been him trying to let us know that he's still watching over us. And with that, we both went to look at the clock, which was still ticking. Thanks, Dad. Message received. We love you too, and we miss you. The reason that I'm writing this now and not before is because I was only reminded of this the other day. I was driving to the store with my son and he wanted me to listen to a song. I don't even remember the words. I just remember that the tune brought me back to a place, a place that I had tucked away in my memory in hopes of forgetting. Now, I can't get that old lady's mouth out of my head. This happened in 1987. I'm sure about the date because of the Whittier earthquake. It just so happens that at that very moment, I was painting a wall in the dining room a different color. That's when it hit. I ended up streaking paint across the wall as I ran over to hold our overly large fish tank from falling off of this stupidly flimsy stand we had it on. This took place in Hacienda Heights, California. My boyfriend at the time wasn't really welcome at my mother's house because she couldn't shake this bad feeling about him. So being young and dumb, I moved out of her house and into a place that I found down the street with him. I wish I had listened to her. It was a small one bedroom bungalow. At first we were getting along just fine, but it seemed like things changed as the months passed and we started fighting more and more. I thought it was odd that I, Susie Homemaker, didn't even want to make that house a home. It was just a weird vibe, and it got darker the longer we stayed. As you walk in the partial glass front door, on the left, there were two white window pane doors on the built-in bookcases on both sides of a fireplace, then the dining room, and in the back was the kitchen. The bedroom was on the right. We couldn't afford a bed frame, so our full-size mattress was on the floor, under the window, and that was the only thing there besides the clock. There was an uneasiness in that bedroom that I couldn't put my finger on. I felt very depressed in there. Oh, little things happened throughout the house from the moment we moved in, but we just laughed it off. Until it was no longer funny. It seemed like when we were at odds with each other, it intensified in a dark way. Oftentimes, my boyfriend would just leave and I was alone, sometimes for days, and I thought that he did it on purpose because he knew that I was scared to be there alone. At first, I was fine, not scared of anything, until one of those nights. I was sleeping and I was jolted up by an extremely loud bang that left my ears ringing. I jumped up, and at first, I looked out the front window, thinking that it was something outside, but the streets were still. I checked the house, but there was nothing out of place. The next night, it happened again, louder than before. Only this time, I glanced at the clock before checking the house. It was 5 o'clock a.m. on the dot, and my room was freezing. I tried to get back to sleep, but I heard muffled wails of a woman. 
I literally had to lift my head from the pillow to listen, but nobody was around. The next day, my boyfriend came home and with a few words and some hand-picked flowers, all was stupidly forgiven. I told him what had happened, but he shrugged it off, telling me that it could have been a backfire or the pipes, and I bought it. One early evening after dinner, we were going to watch TV on the couch in the living room, and I excused myself to go to the bathroom. I kept hearing him yelling out things to me, but I couldn't really make out what he was saying. I opened the door and looked at him, he turned absolutely pale, and he was crawling backwards on the couch with wide eyes. Then he leaped up and ran into the kitchen, looking around and checking the back door. He came out, saying that the door was locked from the inside. After he calmed down and I could understand him, he told me that he was talking to me in the kitchen. He asked me why I was putting a granny house dress on and was asking for snacks and he was getting a bit upset that I didn't answer him. I had no answers. There had been a few times where we both saw what looked like a teenaged boy sitting on the front stoop, sometimes holding his head in his hands, but when we approached him, it was like he was never there. I pointed out faces in the glass panes of the bookcase that looked like they were talking to us while we were watching TV. They were just reflections, but they were reflections of something that wasn't in the room. Their features were outlined by the flickering light from the TV. But after a while, the faces became more defined. In the beginning, my boyfriend thought I was making it all up until he saw it for himself. We heard banging on the bathroom door like somebody was banging with their fist, even when we weren't in there. And an older guy's voice saying, ah, come on, sending us running outside a couple of times then feeling stupid sitting outside, so we went in and stayed spooked for the rest of the day. I called the landlord to ask him if something had happened there or if he could make it stop. But before I could even open my mouth, he was asking if I was calling to complain about something he had no control over. In the background, I heard his wife say, is that the young couple? They want to move, do they? Well, there goes another one. It sounded like this had happened to them a lot before, and that really got my blood boiling. Why would they rent this place to us without even a heads up? Realizing that they would be of no immediate help, I just hung up on him. I couldn't move, I had no money, and my mother for sure wouldn't let me move back in as long as I was with my boyfriend. We lived there for at least four months when our relationship started to spin out of control. He was being forceful and demanding and drinking a lot more. One night he asked me to pick him up, so I did. And somehow I ended up with a broken arm because I didn't want him to drive my car drunk. I had to beg him to shift gears so that I could drive to the ER because he was tired. And after the hospital, I was exhausted and I just wanted to sleep. So I went to the bedroom while he opted to lay on the couch and watch TV. The next thing I know, he's grabbing his stuff, saying that he's not staying there anymore and walking out, leaving me there alone with a broken arm. Wow. I remember that it was a warm night, but it was raining. So I laid on the couch with only the screen door closed so that I could hear the rain. The lights went out, which freaked me out even more. So I put candles on the coffee table and one on the bookcase and sat back down on the couch. I was too afraid to sleep in the bedroom. I sat there and saw those faces, and one was an old lady. She was frowning, and her mouth was moving like she was trying to over-enunciate to tell me something or yell at me. Her face got bigger, like she was coming closer to the glass, and then back. She kept waving her finger at me, her gray hair was straight and put back with a headband. Her mouth was just going on, opening and closing, and the candlelight glistened on her bottom teeth. Her teeth looked a little, I don't know, long and old, if that makes any sense. Then there was a middle-aged man who didn't look directly at me. 
He looked aggravated, but not at me. More like at everything and everyone. And then a crying teenager. His face was so full of despair. I could make out the words, please, and no, no, no. And then he put his hand on his face. Looking at him brought tears to my eyes, and my heart felt so very heavy. It dawned on me that this was the kid on our doorstep. I must have sat there for hours with the blankets up to my nose until the lights came back on and I finally fell asleep. The next morning, I walked down to the corner store and I called my mother, who was happy to find out that I was ready to come home. Before I handed the keys over, my mother had some words with the landlord. He told her that he had the place blessed before I moved in and that he was really hoping that it had worked. He also told my mom that he bought the place already haunted. All he knew from digging was that it was two bungalows together, but one burnt down. But the one that I was renting was the one where an old lady lived, whose grown son had come upon hard times due to his alcoholism. He lost his wife and couldn't keep a job, so he and his teenage son moved into her place with her. His son was so unstable that he found a gun in the house and ended up shooting himself in the bedroom. His grandmother had died from a heart attack not long after. He didn't know what happened to the man. Talk about a roundabout. I don't know why that tune, or maybe the light reflecting off the rain on my windshield, made me think about that old lady's mouth. But it did. Now I understand a little more as to why I hate reflective things in my home. I am Puerto Rican and I live in Brooklyn, but when I was young, I often spent summers in my grandmother's house in Yauco, Puerto Rico. She had a lot of land deep in the mountains, so deep that roads would go off into the wilderness through narrow mountain passes where cliffs were just a few inches off the tire driving in pitch black. If a car came in the opposite direction, either they or you would have to drive in reverse until you found a place to pass each other. It was scary. The property has been with my family for a long time, and my family has been in Yauco as far back as anyone can recall. I used to spend a lot of time with my great-grandfather, Papito, who farmed the land and took care of some cows. He was very old, and he was nearly 100% Taino indigenous Puerto Rican. From him, I would hear stories about the Indios who lived in the wilderness when he was young, who were not culturally assimilated into colonial society after hundreds of years of Spanish occupation. My family would often hide and harbor the culturally wild Puerto Ricans, culturally indigenous, because if Spanish locals found them, Los Matan, they would kill them. I had my first brush with mortality there at age six or so, crushing the jelly bean sized eggs of salamanders I found in the brush and watching the pink underdeveloped hatchling run for cover on instinct. My grandmother told me that what I had done was very wrong and I instantly knew why. I was filled with cold shame and I cried. Papito told me about strange flying discs he would see coming to the mountains and submerging into the lake. He told me about the spirits in the valley that you could hear them, and to be careful walking around the roads of the mountains at night on my way home from his house to my grandmother's. He taught me how to control a bull with its horns and how to ride it. He did a whistle only he could do when he wanted to gain the attention of an animal on the mountain that made them either follow him, go where he directed them, or just settle down. He told me about the legend of Diego Salcedo, which took place there in Yauco. When he was almost 100, Papito was dying, and all of our family came to see him. He was a link to an old time, and so many people in Yauco knew him. They all went to his house. Uncles, aunts, cousins, people from nearby, all gathered at his house on the top of the hill. 
I was too young to be present for his passing. I sort of didn't understand what was going on at the time. I was sent down to my grandmother's house to wait for the proceedings to be over. The sun was going down. The mountains were like shadows rising around me. Walking alone, I started to hear animals all about, crying out. Wild dogs all over the mountains. Chickens were making a ruckus. The pigs in the lower valley were screaming almost like humans. The cows were howling in a way that I can only describe as similar to Cat Stark from Game of Thrones when Rob died. Every single non-human thing in the mountain with an earshot was wailing in a fashion that I've never heard before or since. As a little kid, you can imagine how frightening that was, especially because I was all alone. I hid in the house, looking out the window, waiting for my grandmother and listening to the animals cry. I was especially sensitive to sound then, as it had been a time in my life where I was often sick and constantly on the medication amoxicillin, which I was allergic to. It created this sort of overwhelming extrasensory sound experience. At some point, all the animals stopped making noise and I was thankful. Before bed, I asked my grandmother what had happened, why all of the animals were making that sound. She told me that Papito had just died and that all of the animals on the mountain had realized the powerful being that protected it for so long was gone, that they had seen his spirit pass and it was sensible that this change would affect them very deeply. My grandmother's perspective was that the animals just know these things. I couldn't sleep. I went outside, late at night, curious and scared out of my wits, thinking about the spirits that may be out in the darkness of the mountain wilderness, thinking about that terrible, painful lamentation that was embodied by animals crying like people. I went close to the edge of one of the small nearby cliffs that hung over the endless darkness. I squatted and listened. I heard a sound that scared me a feral cry in the darkness. I don't know what dog it was or if it was a dog at all, but it was certainly too close and I was by myself. It howled and yelped and I regretted coming outside. I was sort of frozen there, afraid to move but afraid to stay. I wouldn't dare call out for my grandmother. I would be scolded for coming out and wandering around at night. She probably wouldn't hear me anyway. A moment later, I heard that whistle that Papito used to do, out in the darkness. The howling stopped. As a child, I didn't think, that couldn't be Papito, he's dead. Like any adult in their right mind would think. I just thought, it's Papito. It had to be. No one else could do that. No one knew how to whistle that way in my family, and it was only us for miles around on the mountain. Where the sound came from would have been impossible for any person to be. Not even during the daytime could they be there. It was deep inside of the wilderness on the severe cliffside. But I knew he was there just the same. I'm sure that at that age, the line between life and death was blurred. Yauko is the area where the chief of Taino lived. It is also where the rebellion began against the Spanish, with the drowning of the conquistador Diego Salcedo. Many of the surviving Taino escaped into the mountains of Yauco and lived in secrecy there for a long time, hiding their lifestyle behind some of the more assimilated natives like Papito. They say the Taino are extinct, but that cannot be. I knew some of them, and I am one too, if only a little bit. When I was little, maybe around seven or so, I had my first paranormal experience. My mom always told me that she felt like I attracted things from the spiritual realm, even as a baby. But this experience is the first one that is my own memory, and I remember it vividly, now at 26 years old. My mom was unlucky enough to have not only my father die, 
but also my little sister's father. My dad passed away due to a car accident, and my sister's dad had committed suicide after a battle with severe depression. Needless to say, my mom had it pretty rough, and being a single working mother, she would often take us to a family friend who babysat us while she worked late nights at the hospital. The woman who babysat us was a warm, kind, and gentle woman named Rhonda. She always took the best care of us, and my sister and I really enjoyed staying with her. Rhonda had two birds who we loved to talk to. They would repeat simple things like, hello, and what's up? We thought it was the coolest thing. After a long day of playing, my sister and I were off to bed and Rhonda tucked me into bed in her spare room downstairs. My sister was still pretty little and she slept in the same room as Rhonda because she was too scared to sleep alone. And Rhonda was like a grandma to us who was more than happy to share her bed if we got scared. I was a big girl and I loved having my own room to sleep in. I was never scared. On this night though, I was having trouble falling asleep and I just kept tossing and turning, growing frustrated that I wasn't asleep. And for some reason, I began to get anxiety and become fearful. I didn't know why I was scared, but I was. After what felt like forever of me just laying there, contemplating getting up and crawling into Rhonda's bed, I heard something in a low, calm male voice say, Marissa, it's okay, just go to sleep. This surprised me, but it didn't scare me. I believe that as a child, you're more open and susceptible to paranormal things due to the fact that you're not conditioned to be fearful yet. With age, you learn what's scary and all the things that go bump in the night that you should run away from. But I was still so innocent that I didn't register this as threatening at all. Actually, it calmed me down and I started to feel very tired and I just accepted what the voice told me and went to sleep. The next morning, Rhonda made us breakfast as she always did. She sat across from me and sipped her coffee. I always asked her for a sip of it because if I wasn't already a strange child, I also had a taste for coffee. She asked me how I slept and I told her that I was scared, but that somebody had told me to go to sleep. She looked at me confused and she asked me if I had had a dream that somebody was talking to me. But I told her, no, I was awake. She said it was probably the birds talking again. And I told her I was sure that it wasn't. She then asked me if it was a man's voice or a woman's voice. And when I instantly said it was a man's voice, her face changed from the usual cheery, warm expression to put off and uncomfortable. I had never seen her face look like that before, and I think that's why I remember this so vividly. She very quickly changed the subject and we went about our day, and I didn't think about that again for years. Fast forward into my teens, my mom and I were having a discussion about the paranormal because I had had a lot of strange activity happening. She asked me what the very first experience I remember was that I thought was paranormal. I shared the story about the man's voice at Rhonda's house and how odd Rhonda's reaction had been. My mom looked at me and her eyes widened a bit. Rhonda had gone MIA a few years later and unfortunately she just slowly lost contact with us. Eventually she was no longer a part of our lives. I hadn't seen her in years. When my mom collected her thoughts, she looked at me and said, Marissa, you know Rhonda's son died in that room, right? I did not. I knew she had had a son who'd passed away of a tragic overdose, but I was so young that I had never met him. So I didn't really think anything about it. I looked back at my mom and we just didn't have anything to say. We were both thinking the same thing. If I was hearing a spirit speak to me, there's a good chance it could have been her son. From what my mom said about him, he was very kind and caring, much like his mom. Maybe that's why I wasn't afraid when he, if he, spoke to me. 
I'm not saying this is factually what happened, but it does make me wonder. The voice I heard was real, that much I do know. Regardless of who it belonged to, it's sure to me that that much is true. Since that experience, I've had many more, and unfortunately, they got much more sinister as I got older. It got very, very dark for a while, and I witnessed things that you usually only see in horror movies. I still think of this experience often, and hopefully you enjoyed it. Regardless, it's not something I'm likely to forget anytime soon. In August of 2019, my mom got sick. She had a stroke, has diabetes, and so on. So the first time that my mom got sick, my brother was the one who stayed with her. And the second time she got sick, I stayed with her. Mostly because my brother couldn't be patient enough to take care of her again. My mom was being placed in a room that could fit six patients. There was this one time that I went to the canteen, and I bought like food and stuff like that. When I was in the elevator, a guy came in, so it was just the two of us. After I bought some things from the canteen, I went back using the same elevator, and I accidentally met the same man again, with the same elevator, just the two of us in it. We talked a little bit before the elevator opened. When it did, we heard some people screaming and crying. He asked me, what happened? Why are they screaming and crying like that? I said, I don't know, maybe a patient just passed away. If yes, may they rest in peace. I barely heard him say, thank you, like whispering. I didn't really pay any attention to it. I said goodbye to him and I walked to my mom's room. After a little bit of conversation, I went back to my mom's room and the crying and screaming voice was actually from that room. So I was kind of curious about who the person was that had passed. The nurse opened the curtain to prepare to move the body, and I was absolutely frozen. The person who had died was the guy that was talking to me in the elevator, and who had asked me what had happened. After that day, I had nightmares for a week, and now I'm always pretty paranoid whenever I go into an elevator. I don't know if this story is interesting to anyone else, but it definitely shook me up. I'm a 30-year-old man, blonde, blue-eyed, and a work ethic like boxer from Animal Farm. I work at a BJ's wholesale club from 8 in the morning until 4 in the afternoon, pushing carts, filling propane tanks, and helping out where they need me. In the mornings, I usually walk around the parking lot while listening to a queue of music and podcasts that I line up for myself the day before. All of it going in through one earbud, while I have the other ear open, paying attention to my surroundings. Also, I'm not really prone to unusual or paranormal happenings in my life. So needless to say, the following event really caught me by surprise. To set the stage, it was between 8 and 9 in the morning. The sun was out, and I'd already gotten the propane filling station set for the day and I pushed all the shopping carts left in the parking lot and stalls overnight back to where they needed to be near the store entrance. I'm about to do what I call my morning perimeter walk. This walk involves walking the outer edge of the parking lot and behind the store to make sure that nothing is out of place and that nobody has taken it upon themselves to tag the back of the store, leaving me to photograph it and show the store management at the most opportune moment. I've just started my perimeter walk, and I'm just about into an episode of the Rooster Teeth podcast, always open on Spotify. I'm minding my own business, tunnel visioning out, and suddenly I hear a woman's voice humming in my left ear. Thinking back, it reminded me a little bit of the lullaby hummed by the Huntress in the game Dead by Daylight. 
This snapped me out of my routine. I paused the podcast and I took the earbud out of my right ear. I listened carefully to get an idea of where the humming was coming from for about a minute and a half, but it had completely stopped. All I heard was the usual background noise. It was too close for it to be any car audio from a car pulling out from behind me. I would have heard the engine and the sound of the tires against the pavement and veered out of the way for them to pass. I want to make it clear that nobody is walking around the parking lot aside from me. Everyone else is either filling up at the gas station or in the store. There's a manager who comes out and sits in their truck at the end of the parking lot where this happened, but he wasn't anywhere to be seen when this took place. After coming to grips with the fact that I'm nearing my two-year anniversary working at this store and that there's no way it was anything that wanted to hurt me, I just shrugged it off and continued onward to tackle the rest of the day. I had never had an auditory experience like that before in the nearly two years that I've worked there, and I didn't experience anything like that for the rest of that weekend. I don't know if anybody else has had an experience like that, but if you have, let me know. I'd honestly like to share in the experience. Over the course of two years, I've had weird dreams about a very specific creature lurking in the attic. It always felt malevolent. Now I don't know if it's an actual thing or my subconscious messing with me, but it deeply unsettled me in ways that my dreams almost never do. As somebody who is always aware that they're dreaming, even dreams where I'm being hunted down don't scare me, but this does. There have been so many dreams about it, but a few stick in my head. The least threatening one was a dream where I'm playing video games in my room. I glance out of my bedroom door, and I see an arm dangling from the open attic. The hand moves like it's beckoning me to come closer. I don't, because, obviously. But I watch it. It never leaves the attic, but it keeps trying to get me to go to it. Another dream, I'm in a house I've never been in. My sister and nieces are in this house with me, and I get the impression that this thing is threatening my family. I'm angry, so I get vocally aggressive. I get my family out of there and go back to confront the thing. I see it for the first time in all the dreams that I've had. It was a woman with light purple skin and dreadlocks. I don't remember how this dream ended, but there were more dreams after, never including my family again, just me. The most intense encounter I had was a dream where the attic was right above the bed I was sleeping in. I was lying there, very aware that it was watching me. I figured if I ignored it, it would go away. Wrong. It slowly pulled the covers off of me. After a few minutes of lying there, cold, Trying to decide if it was safe to pull the blanket back up, it grabs me by the throat and lifts me up about a foot off the bed and starts choking me. I felt like my lungs were going to burst when it let go and let me fall back onto the bed, gasping for breath. I don't know how many dreams I've had since this one, but I know it's been at least a year since I dreamt about it. I'm very uneasy around addicts now, and I always expect to look up and see it again when I pass underneath one, awake or not. Even right now, I keep throwing glances at the attic door right outside my bedroom. Nothing's there, of course, but it's still on my mind. If this thing is not my subconscious and it's an actual entity, I have no idea what it could be. In my limited experience with the paranormal, I've never encountered anything that felt malevolent before just this. My hope is that either my brain just decided it wanted to be terrified of addicts, or that this thing got bored with me and left me forever. Mm -hmm. 
So my family and I moved into a new house, which is a two by four house. It used to have an attic, but it's been sealed off. After a couple of months into living in this house, sometimes I would be watching TV and hear scratching from the roof. I just played it off as birds are very common where I live. After about three weeks, the scratching got worse and more frequent. It's like something's trying to scratch its way out of the roof. The attic entrance thing is above the outside of my sister's room. One day, my sister tells my dad that the seal is open. My dad gets confused because it was supposed to be sealed off. My dad goes to close it and realizes that it's really hard to open and close, so whatever opened it had to be strong. And that's when I started to get skeptical. The same night, I went to get some snacks from the fridge. I opened it to find out that they were gone. I figured that my siblings must have eaten them. In the morning, my parents are going on and on about a missing cake. That cake was supposed to be for my niece's birthday. They asked if I had anything to do with it, and I said no, along with my siblings. I was getting really suspicious about the attic. So one day, I built up the courage to go check it out. Note that I am probably the most paranoid person in the world, so I was scared for my life, but my curiosity got the best of me. I get the ladder, a torch, and a knife just in case. I open the thing up and I shine my torch to see nothing. But as I search more, I see the cake, empty snack packets, dirty clothes, and a short, dark silhouette that freezes in its spot. Immediately I bold and scream for my parents and I tell them everything. They tell me to stay in my room. They go up and check, but he was gone. I am still shaken up about that moment, and I get nightmares from it to this day. We've since moved from that house and haven't had any more issues like that, and we live a normal, non-scary life, but I think that day will live with me forever. I have a weird story to tell you, but I promise that it's true. This happened about 10 years ago. It was at night. My older sister and I were on the second floor, spending the evening with our oldest brother and his wife. I can't recall what we were chatting with them about, but after a while, about 10 o'clock, my sister and I decided that it was time to go to sleep. We're heading downstairs. My brother has a switch right next to his main front door, into the stairs, that controls the light of the attic, where the stairs come to an end. We usually just put useless stuff there. It's a very small room. The rest of it is just flat, empty roof. So as we're heading down, we notice that this light was on in the attic, so I switched it off. Then, both my sister and I heard the exact voice of my mom saying, Turn on that light, I'm up here. Now, we were both certain that it was my mom and that it was coming from upstairs, so we didn't say anything and I turned it back on. We headed downstairs and that's when we both were totally shocked. As we opened the door to find my mom drinking tea with my other brother and the TV on, we froze, unable to move or speak. My mom noticed that something strange was going on, so she asked us what was wrong. After a moment of silence, we explained what happened. She didn't say anything, but told us to go to sleep. Of course, I couldn't. I kept thinking about what had happened the entire night. Who or what made that sound, and how did it do it? I mean, among all voices, the one of my mom is the one that I know the best, the one I grew up with, so how could it mimic it? well enough to fool both my sister and I. To this day, whenever I ask my sister if she remembers what happened, she says, yes, and then immediately changes the subject. Almost every single night, I walk up to the attic to chill in there or whatever, and I've never stumbled into anything weird. Just that one instance, but who knows?
I'm pretty sure my roommate's house is haunted, but they don't believe in ghosts or souls very much, so they don't think much of the weird things that happened around here. You can clearly hear footsteps in the attic. I used to live in an apartment, so you can definitely tell what different sounds you hear. With that, they are very distinctly the footsteps of someone pacing in the attic. There's only one way in or out of it in my roommate's room, so I know it isn't some squatter or something like that. Things in the house move around on their own, too. It happens in front of my friend and I a lot, to the point where we're kind of used to it. Even though we're used to it, though, I would be more at peace with it if I knew more about the spirits here. Any attempt to contact them has failed, so I assume they just don't want to talk. I haven't had any negative encounters with them, though. The worst I've had is probably knocking over some stuff on the couch. Still, I just want to know what I'm living with. Is that too much to ask? This happened when I was around 9 or 10. I was staying the night at my friend Catherine's for the first time. We met the summer before, and we'd been inseparable ever since. Cat lived in this old two-story house, surrounded by woods and dirt road. The house itself gave me an uneasy feeling when I first saw it. The shutters were falling off. The paint on the house seemed to be fading. It was an old piece of crap now that I think about it, but at the time, I was excited. I remember walking in after staring at the house for what seemed like 20 minutes. Surprisingly, the inside was a lot nicer than the outside, so I pushed that uneasy feeling down and just shrugged it off as nerves. I remember the smell of the house. I can't pinpoint it, but it was different, like walking into a musty room. I started to walk around, just to explore my surroundings, but I noticed Kat's mom watching me. I simply smiled and waved, but she just stood there, staring at me, wide-eyed. I had never met her before, but why was she staring at me like that? Suddenly, Kat flew around the corner and tackled me. We both fell and started to giggle. I noticed Kat's mom out of the corner of my eye start to turn around and walk off, and she was gone. Fast forward a couple of hours, Kat and I are laying on a beanbag in her room watching Children of the Corn, which, by the way, was one of my favorite movies at the time. I grew up watching horror movies, mostly Stephen King or any movie that my mom was watching at the time. Not her decision, but mine, because I love the feeling that a good horror movie gives you. She felt the same way, and that's why we clicked so much. Anyway, we were sitting here watching this movie, and suddenly the door opposite us slams closed. We both jumped and giggled and brushed it off because, well, we were kids. Until the second time, when it creaked open and slammed again, not seconds after the first time. Now I'm sitting there staring at this door, trying to figure out how in the world it's opening and closing by itself. In the midst of all that, the only other person in this house is Kat's mom, which I figured out earlier in the day was also just a tad creepy. Do you think it's just your mom? I asked, but she just shook her head. Are you sure? I asked again, but this time she said something that gave me the chills and still does. She said, my mom isn't home. It's just me and you, silly. I just stared at her, trying to wrap my head around what she had just said. Who leaves their nine-year-old home alone with a friend in a two-story house? Where's your mom? I asked her. She's at work. I giggled, thinking that she was just trying to trick me. No, she's at work. She only works for a couple of hours, so she leaves me here because she trusts me. 
At this point, I'm just looking at her, and she noticed this look of worry on my face. What's wrong? She asked. I said, if your mom is at work, then who was that lady staring at me earlier? As I said this, we heard what seemed like footsteps at the time, but thinking about it now, it sounded more like shuffling in one spot above us. I'm completely scared at this point. Every hair on my neck is standing on end, and I just want to leave. I start to get up when Cat pulled me back down and asked me if I heard that noise. I nodded. It was silent again, until the footsteps were back, but louder and faster. We both stared up at the ceiling, and she grabbed my hand. This happens every day, she whispered. I looked over at her, and I could see true fear on her face. The footsteps stopped, and she looked at me. Her face flushed white. Is there an attic? I asked. She pointed up toward the ceiling. Well, maybe it's just squirrels or birds, I kept thinking over and over. You ever notice when you're really quiet, that's when you can hear almost everything around you? Imagine if you're sitting in a house with your best friend alone at 10 years old, and you hear the giggle of a three-year-old child. Mind you, she has no siblings. We were completely alone. Kat was just as scared as I was. I remember thinking that I just wanted to get out of this house. I grabbed her and ran out the door. At least we would feel safer and less scared outside the house than we would in it. Want to hear a story? Kat asked, pulling my mind back into reality. I nodded. Well, this house used to be a daycare. There was this lady that would watch the kids, and one day she just locked them all in the attic. And then, she hung herself from a rope in the kitchen. They all died because the kids were hungry and thirsty, and no one found them for months afterwards. In this house. My heart started to pound, my eyes wide with fear, and I just looked at her. It's true, she said. I've seen them, the little kids, every day, but I've never seen the lady. But you have, earlier. After she told me this, I don't remember much else except running out the door of her room and making it outside. Cat followed, begging me to stay, but I just had to get out. My stomach felt like knots. I felt as though I had walked into a horror movie, and I just wished the day had never happened. Fast forward years later, that was the last day I had ever seen or heard from Kat. I remember her always coming to play outside at my dad's during the day. I remember what she looked like. I never remembered meeting her parents or seeing them out in public. I'm now 27, and I can't seem to find any proof that she exists. All my friends that I was friends with then, I'm still friends with now, even after all these years. But why not her? I think her scary story might have had some flaws, but I still wonder what happened in that house. I've driven by there maybe 15 times, and I still wonder if maybe she was one of the ones that never made it out. So, I live in a small town in the southwest of Scotland. One of those towns where if you don't know someone, you will definitely know one of their friends. In 2015, I moved into a flat or apartment with my two children and my partner. The flat seemed nice and it was in a quiet part of town. Needless to say, we were all really happy with the move. At the time, my eldest son Bobby was four and my youngest Derek was three. Soon after moving in, I started noticing strange things happening. For example, the washing machine turned itself on and off at the wall. Doors opened on their own. But the strangest incidents were yet to come. One night, when the kids were in bed, about six months after moving in, Bobby came running to the living room and said, 
Daddy, please could you come and tell the hand in my room to stop trying to play with my teddy bears? So, naturally, I went into his room and told this, what I thought was imaginary, hand off. About two weeks later, my son Bobby came to me again. With the complete matter-of-fact innocence of a child, he goes, Daddy, did you know there's a ghost in your attic? I didn't think much of it. Kids will be kids. The next day, I was at work, talking to a colleague about where we'd moved to. Out of nowhere, he goes, Hey, did you know that back in April of 2014, some young guy hung himself in your flat? Suddenly, Bobby talking about a ghost in the attic started to feel a lot more concerning. What blows my mind is that Bobby had never talked about ghosts before moving here. At the time, he didn't even know what an attic or a loft was. I did some digging and even spoke to a friend who's a local police officer. I asked him about the whole incident with the young guy, and he goes, Oh yeah, that's true. He hung himself in the attic up there. We still live in that house, and to this day, strange things happen from time to time. Most recently, the TV turned itself on and turned the volume up to full blast, all on its own. I was the only one home at the time. What's really strange is that my youngest son Derek has never mentioned anything ghostly. It's all very strange, but very real. This happened years ago, but the memory is still very clear. After attending a wedding dinner, my friend drove me home. It was very late at night. We saw this old lady walking by the roadside. She was walking alone and holding an umbrella. Being as kind as he always is, my friend stopped and asked the old lady if she needed a ride. The old lady said that she was heading to the bridge just a few miles ahead. My friend asked her to hop in and she got into the back seat of the car. Then we continued to drive. A few minutes later, the weight of the car suddenly lifted. He was driving an old sedan, so if someone gets in the car, it weighs down. And if someone gets out, it lifted, and you could definitely feel it. I looked behind, and this lady had just vanished, like out of thin air. Mind you, the car was still moving when it happened. However, the old lady's umbrella was still in the back seat. I looked at my friend, and he knew what had happened too, but we didn't dare say a word. I just told him the umbrella was still there, and we continued on. When we reached the bridge, I put the umbrella on the ground, and we drove home. We never discussed it since. Because really, why would we? We both know what we saw. And we both know that we picked up a ghost that night. I've had paranormal stuff happening in my house for a few years now. I've always been able to see ghosts around and hear them. Recently, though, there have been more experiences. I've heard footsteps and I've seen shadow figures way more often recently. It's always when I'm alone in my home. I hear people shout my name even though nobody else is there. I've always believed in spirits and demons. Recently, I bought this doll. It was really old and it definitely had a sense of creepiness. We had purchased this doll from a boot sale in the street. It's where people park their cars and you shop out of the boot or the trunk. My stepdad and I have been the only ones to touch the doll. We both touched the doll on Tuesday this week when we were setting it up. I put it on the drawers at the end of my bed and I fell asleep. At 2.58 in the morning, I woke up feeling ill and I felt like I was being watched. I put the doll in one of the drawers, as I didn't like the sense that it was giving me. My stepdad and I woke up the next day with horrible symptoms. 
we ended up with a non-viral bacterial tonsillitis infection. I spent the whole of Thursday in bed violently shaking from this illness. That night, my fan flew off the bedside table. It had been there for weeks, and I didn't move, so there was no reason for it to move. I don't know if this is all just a big coincidence or not. I don't know if we have a haunted house, a haunted doll, or nothing. But it's definitely been weird. I grew up in an apartment complex for the first six or so years of my life. It's been a long time, so I don't really truly remember it. But I know I used to live in an apartment complex near a mire. Well, we ended up moving into my grandmother's house with her after my grandfather passed away, and there were some disturbances I remember at my young age. The first time I ever had something paranormal happen was when I was helping my mom and grandma clean out my grandpa's old room so that my mother and I could use it as our room. I was really afraid to be alone as a kid, so I slept in my mom's room. They had had separate rooms, so my grandma had converted one of the living rooms into her bedroom. Well, one day we were taking a break from cleaning out the room, and we were laughing out in my grandma's room. I can't remember exactly why, but my mom asked me to go to my grandpa's room to grab something she had forgotten. It might have been a drink. Anyway, as I'm walking toward his room, I hear the most ghostly moan I've ever heard in my life. It almost sounded like something straight out of Scooby-Doo. I ran back to my mom and grandma, and they said that I was just being silly. A typical answer that a child would get from adults after telling a story like that. And my mom was an atheist who tried to explain and debunk everything she could. On occasion, I would hear stuff. I would see shadows. I would sense that somebody was watching me, but I was never really truly bothered by anything. My grandma would have liked to think that it was my grandpa messing around, but I was never really sure. I just knew that stuff was happening that I couldn't explain, and I didn't like it. As a kid, I loved horror games. I loved watching scary movies and stuff like Ghost Hunters, which did scare me and keep me up some nights. But it was always interesting to me, because I truly believed my house was haunted. I liked to pretend that it wasn't, though, so I could sleep at night. My mom died on November 5th of 2006, and ever since that day, things got weird, and the feelings of being watched and noises and shadows increased, but nothing super significant. I always thought it was due to the fact that my grandma had, like, six cats. One night in particular that I remember was when my friend came over to spend the night, we played video games, and he, in particular, loved to talk to me about his dreams because they were so creative and vivid. I mean, they could have been comic books. Well, we went to sleep, and before that, I closed my bedroom door because one of the cats would come into the room all the time and wake us up by licking plastic stuff for like an hour straight. Almost suddenly, out of a dead sleep, I woke up. No reason behind it, I just did. I was drawn to look at the bedroom door, and it slowly opens. An almost pitch black cloud hovers into my room and stays close to the ceiling. As this is happening, my friend is yelling in his sleep, no, stop. And at this time, not only am I scared beyond belief, but I have the strangest, eeriest feeling that I've ever had in my life. I was so scared, but also simultaneously so tired that I covered my face with my blanket and eventually just passed out. I woke up the next day and everything seemed normal. I asked my friend about last night, and he said that he didn't see, feel, or hear anything. But when I asked him about his dream, he said, I actually can't remember it. That struck me as absolutely wild because this guy would always tell me about how cool his dreams were. He seemed to remember them all. There were other things that I can't remember, 
My dad said one night he was intoxicated and opened his door to go upstairs and grab some food out of the fridge. When he says he ran into my mom as he walked out of the door and he kind of stumbled back and looked, but then nobody was there. From his face when he tells this story, you can tell how sobering of an experience this had to have been. All of us, however, would occasionally hear my mom's voice calling out to us when she hadn't. And personally, I would just freeze and look in every direction to try to find where it had come from. But sometimes she wasn't even in the house. Fast forward to about 2013, a year or so before I eventually moved out. My grandmother's health and brain were deteriorating rapidly until she finally called 911 and went into the ER where she was diagnosed with brain and lung cancer, almost identical to what my mom had when she passed. After what I think was like a month, she ended up passing away. And ever since that day, the house was not the same. It was odd before then, but after that, it went from like level 20 to 100. Stuff was being knocked over, voices were echoing from the hallways in the basement, loud voices talking from other rooms when you were alone in the house, people coughing right into your ear, shadows walking down the hall, doors being slammed in the basement. The list goes on and on. I had a friend move into my house that always told me that when he went downstairs to take a shower, somebody would shake the bathroom door handle while he was in there. He said he would open it multiple times to find nobody on the other side. He was still trying to figure out how I was doing it. Until one day he realized that I wasn't, because I had another friend of mine come over to my house because he wanted help dyeing his hair black. I was in that phase already, so I helped him. He went downstairs to take a shower, and when he came back upstairs, my buddy and I were playing a video game. He walks in and says, how the hell did you guys get up here so fast without making a noise? We were really puzzled until he told us that somebody had kept shaking the door handle. My friend went pale and told him exactly what had been happening to him. At that point, we were all scared and left the house for a bit. He stopped coming over as much, and honestly, I don't blame him. He vowed to never shower at my house again. Between hearing doors in the basement, seeing shadows, stuff like that, my dad kept telling me how when he was home by himself, he would just hear my mom and grandma screaming his name from other parts of the house, which drove him back to alcoholism. Then one morning, I woke up to find my grandma's last cat that we had had died. That was shortly before we moved out. When I say these encounters intensified, I mean it. All of my friends that came over just said that the house didn't feel right. It wasn't welcoming. We would always hear voices or cats meowing even though at that point all the cats had passed and nobody would be there. I would go into my basement before work and open all of the doors. And when I'd get home, I'd go check and find that pretty much all of them were closed when nobody could have possibly been in the house. And this is just all my perspective. My friends and my roommate especially had their own crazy stories that still get me to this day, no matter how many times I hear them. Ever since I moved out into a new apartment, now a trailer, I haven't experienced anything else. It's been a nice change of pace, and I hope to never experience anything of that kind ever again. The high school I attended was said to be haunted by a girl who had been pushed off of the bell tower and broke her neck, causing her to pass away instantly as she hit the ground. Before it was turned into a modern day high school, I believe it was an all girls boarding school. Strangely enough, I can't find a lot of information on the building. It would have been a boarding school around the time when this unfortunate event happened. There were a few small stories circulating about the school being haunted, but alas, they could have been rumors completely made up. However, I had an experience of my own that made me believe them. 
I'll start with one of the stories that I heard from others. Either a teacher or a student, I forget which, needed a guide dog or a therapy dog, which they would bring to the school with them. However, the dog would refuse to go anywhere near the stairwell, which led to the bell tower. It would whine and try to back up, and it just wouldn't go toward the bottom end of the second floor, the ICT corridor, which is where the doors led out to the stairwell. It's also where I had my own experience. I'd also like to add that there is no longer a bell in the bell tower. It wasn't there when I first started at the school, and it's still not there to this day. I believe it was removed and the door leading up to it was sealed shut, meaning that even if we ascended the stairs to it, we wouldn't be able to get much farther than that. Now, on to my experience. It was lunchtime and I had taken a shortcut through the math corridor, turning right into the ICT corridor on the second floor, toward the door that leads to that stairwell. One set of stairs led down to a small foyer and the canteen on the right, and the other set of stairs led up toward the sealed off bell tower. As I was walking along the ICT corridor, I realized that it was awfully quiet. No one was around, no teachers or students whatsoever. It was so quiet it made my ears ring. A set of footsteps joined me and were walking behind me, about halfway down along the corridor. I thought it must have been another student, so I didn't bother turning around to see who it was. I just wanted to get to lunch. I got to the doors, which are big, heavy wooden doors that don't stay open on their own. They have to be pushed with quite a bit of force and latched onto a heavy-duty magnet that holds them open, unless you press a button to release them. The amount of times I was smacked in the face by these things is astounding. So I get to the doors and I push one of them open, not bothering to latch it to the magnet on the wall, thinking that the person walking behind me will just catch it as I let go and walk through it down to the canteen for lunch too. As I began walking down the set of stairs to the canteen, I suddenly stopped mid-step. Something didn't feel right. I realized the doors hadn't made the noise that they do when they slam shut, and the footsteps had stopped at the door. I waited for someone to pass me on the stairs, but nobody did. So I turn around slowly, and the door that I walked through is stood open on its own, without being latched onto the magnet. It was ajar, far enough open that I could see down the corridor, but not quite far enough for it to catch the magnet and stay open. And the student that I was sure was walking behind me was nowhere to be seen, even though I would have sworn up and down that they were right behind me. Their footsteps weren't that far away. Before I could even gasp, the door shuts, slowly, as if somebody was holding it open and then slowly and gently shut it so it wouldn't make a noise. I couldn't get out of there fast enough. I turned and ran down the rest of the steps. I never took that shortcut alone again, and I always made sure I went the long way around if no one was with me. What was even weirder to me was the fact that it felt like somebody was watching me during this whole event. It was so creepy. This happened in mine and my husband's first house, several months after our oldest son was born. We had lived in the house for almost four years before he was born, but had never experienced anything like this before. It's actually the only time I've ever experienced something that I would consider to be paranormal. My husband claims his grandma's home was haunted growing up. Either way, this experience shook the both of us in a whole new way. We had finally decided to move our son into his nursery. For the first six to seven months, he had slept in our room in his own bassinet, but we decided it was time to get him adjusted to his crib and his room. So we gathered the strength and made it happen. We had dug out the baby monitor that my mom had gotten us months prior to set up security, if you will. Granted, this was 1997, so they weren't anything fancy but enough to help us feel better about our choice to move our son into his room. 
In addition to the baby monitors, we had put up one of those moving night lights in his room, the ones where the lampshade would project the pictures onto the wall, moving ever so slowly. This one was made up of friendly sea creatures, and our son loved it. The first night that we actually slept separately from our son, we both woke up at the same time. My husband looked at me, and I looked at him, and then we listened to the monitor for a minute, but it was quiet. It didn't appear that our son had woken us up. So, what had happened? I almost just went back to sleep, calling it jitters. But my husband sort of grabbed my arm, not hard, but firm, and he whispered, What the hell? while looking straight ahead. Following his gaze, I could see that each of the four drawers to our dresser were pulled open. I turned on the light and we both hopped out of bed. It was around 2 a.m., and we weren't sure what was going on, so we didn't speak with our mouths, just with our eyes. My husband grabbed his military knife and motioned for me to follow him. I did, and he handed me another, smaller knife, which I held tightly, continuing to follow him, me against the wall, him in front of me, walking toward the baby's room, and leaving no blind spots as we did. When we got to the room, my husband opened the door swiftly, and with force, but quietly. It was just our son, fast asleep, no one else. My husband tells me to stay with the baby while he checks the house. I ask him to please call 911, and he tells me that he will as soon as he gets downstairs. He tells me he's going to shut the door, so when he does, I set the knife down, pick up my son, and sit. I was just rocking him back and forth, staring off at the fun sea creatures dancing all over the walls. It was comforting. After sitting or rocking for a while, I started to feel a bit warmer. Not like a fever, but best described as how it feels when somebody sits really close to you. You can feel their body heat. While feeling this, I'm looking down at my son, debating if he looks or feels warm, but he looks comfortable still sleeping ever so soundly. Suddenly, a mitten on my son's left hand flies off in a way that it might if someone had ripped it off of him hastily. He wasn't moving his hands, and this hadn't woken him up, but it certainly got me up. I was now standing, breathing a bit heavier, and wondering where the heck my husband was. Moments later, my husband opens the door. It scared me at first, I just really wanted the sound of footsteps approaching to be his footsteps. When they were indeed, I was so relieved and I hugged him and I told him rapidly that we had to get out of this room. He wasn't whispering any longer, telling me, okay, let's go back to our room or even downstairs. He started to shuffle us out saying the police were going to send someone by. He said he checked everywhere in the house. No one could possibly be inside. He seemed to feel better but I was still afraid. We made our way to the family room, which was on the first floor, center of the house, really. You could see the whole area from the top of the stairs and from two of the bedroom doorways, our room and the baby's room. From where I was sitting, I could see the nightlight reflecting off my son's walls. So I watched them again. This time I was wary of the room though. I couldn't help but wonder what the heck I had actually experienced up there but I just tried to keep my cool while waiting for the police. My husband asked me what I was staring at. I said, our son's room. Then I told him what I had felt in there. At first he sort of smiled, but then in all sincerity, he said, maybe it's a ghost. I said, excuse me? He didn't elaborate, probably because of the loud knock on the front door. The police were here now, waiting for one of us to let them in. Long story short, there was no guy, no person, no nothing, at least not in our house, and not the surrounding area the officers had checked. It was a quiet night in our town. I wasn't having it though, at least not that night. I told my husband we should go get a hotel, have our parents and such search the place again tomorrow. He said he would stay at the house, but that he would send my son and I to his mom's house. By the next night, maybe it was even two nights that had passed, 
my husband had convinced me to come home. We were on the phone, and he told me that the home was fine. He had decided that we had just overreacted. For a bit, I guess I agreed with him. When he picked us up from his mom's house later that day, I asked him what he thought about the mitten incident, the one that flew off our son's hand. He just smiled again, and I asked what he was smiling about. He just thought I had nothing to worry about. He said, think of it like a guardian angel or something. No harm has come of this thing, right? I told him he couldn't be serious, that if he thought our house was haunted, we should go now back to his mom's. Then we somehow just sort of found a way to laugh it all off. By the time we pulled into our driveway, I was very excited to sleep in our bed, happy to be home, and I actually felt sort of silly for making such a fuss. My husband put our son down in his room and then joined me on the couch with the baby monitor. I remember laying there sort of nodding off as we watched some late night TV. Above the TV are the two bedroom doors. My peripherals are on my son's bedroom doorway, but I'm only keeping it there in the event something about it changes. I was nodding in and out for a bit before I'm wide awake, sitting straight up. My husband says something like, whoa, what's wrong? But I just turn his head to the upstairs and he sees the same thing that I am. The fun sea creature light is spinning rapidly, or at least it's projecting as though it is. I tell my husband to go turn it off. Just as I do, we hear the sound of something falling. We know it came from our son's room because we heard it externally, but also through the baby monitor. He hopped up and ran upstairs. He heads into the room and he's gone for a minute. When he comes back out, the baby is in his arms and also the diaper bag. He calmly asks me to grab our bags, which were still by the door, and to follow him to the car. We get settled and he tells me that he's running in just to grab some of his overnight stuff and to lock the doors. Then he's gone. So I do. I lock the doors and turn the headlights on, just wanting to illuminate all of that darkness. My husband dashes outside. He's got a handful of stuff and without a word, he buckles in and starts to back out of the driveway. We start heading back toward his mom's house. I hadn't even asked what had happened up to this point, but about five minutes in, I had to know. He was checking to see if the baby was asleep, as though he could actually understand what we were about to talk about. It was sweet, but also a little unsettling, because he, my not-scared-of-anything husband, was terrified. He said, we're going to stay with mom for a minute and then figure the rest out. Maybe sell the damn place. It's too small anyway. Sell the house? He just looked uncomfortable, trying to get more out of him, but having a hard time with it. He finally said, it opened up his drawers. When I went up there, the light was going nuts and his drawers, they were wide open. We can't stay there. And so we didn't. Sure, we got our stuff, but we never stayed there and we didn't bring our son there anymore. In the end, we had the place blessed, handed over the keys, and haven't really looked back, other than to talk about Remember When, which isn't exactly frequent. Basically, I don't miss that house. Not even a little bit. I was probably 10 to 12 years old, and my friend, I'll call him Bill, and I were going over to another friend's house, I'll call him Jake, for a sleepover. I'll keep this brief, but this has always stuck with me, and I felt like sharing. We were all hanging out in the living room in the late afternoon. I wanted a drink, so I walked into Jake's kitchen. When you walked in, there was a table to your immediate right. I think it was Jake's birthday or something, so there were some balloons tied to the chairs. I looked over and I saw an old man sitting in one of the chairs. At least I thought I did. I only saw him for a split second, and I assumed I was just seeing things. Never mentioned it to my friends because it was honestly just a, oh, I thought I saw something out of the corner of my eye kind of thing. 
An hour or so went by, and Bill went to the kitchen for some food or whatever. When he came back, he told Jake and I that he saw a man sitting at the kitchen table. I got so excited, because this was a damn sleepover, and now we had ghosts involved. I told them that I thought I had seen the same thing earlier, and Jake said it sounded like his dead grandfather. Later that night, Jake's dad was working at the kitchen table before going to his bedroom. Once he was out of there, I went back to get some food, and I saw him still sitting at the table. I literally turned to ask, didn't you just leave? But there was nobody there. Some other things happened after that, but I kind of chalked those things up to our overactive imaginations given the first thing. I have two reasons, though, to believe that this wasn't a ghost. Number one, maybe we mistook one of the balloons for a human head. Totally possible. Number two, maybe I did tell my friends what I saw the first time, and I'm just blocking that part out of my memory. This would make what Bill said seem totally unbelievable, because he was younger than me and probably just wanted attention. But I'm 90% sure I never said anything to them, because I really didn't think anything of it when I first saw it. The balloon thing has been my main theory. I'm not a believer or a disbeliever in the paranormal. This is the only story I have that could have been paranormal but it's really hard to tell what happened. I had two friends named James and Sarah. Their basement was super creepy and a lot of weird things happened there. This is one of them. It was a random summer night just like any other, with the exception of some of the hauntings they had experienced getting more frequent and bolder, I guess you could say. James was watching TV downstairs while Sarah was taking a shower upstairs. While James was watching TV, he saw what he thought was smoke, but it was in the shape of a person. It passed right between him and the TV. He didn't really give it much thought and assumed he was just seeing things. A few moments later, he heard a shriek and then what sounded like somebody running down the stairs, but only stepping on about every third step. It was Sarah, wearing only shorts and a sports bra. She bolted out of the house into her mom's house, which was the house in the front of the lot. James chased her to find out what was wrong. She finally calmed down and said, I finished my shower and I was laying on my back, playing on my phone. My feet were dangling off the edge of the bed. I thought I heard the bedroom door creak open a bit. I thought it was you, but no one was there. That's when I felt somebody grab my ankles and try to pull me off the bed. That's why I ran out of the house. They did not stay in the house that night. Sarah actually had bruises around her ankles in the shape of fingerprints. That house is creepy. They told me that at any given time in the night, you can hear people talking in the empty rooms. Shadow people peer around the doorways. Things move or disappear randomly all the time. James even caught a picture once of that smoke while there was nothing in the room. In one of the pictures, the smoke even has a face. I have no idea what's going on in that house, but I don't know how they live there. I used to work in a casino. One night, I was approached by an elderly woman asking about paging someone over the intercom. I tried to explain where to go, but she insisted that I personally walk her to the desk where they can do that. As I walk her through the casino, she started talking to me. She mentioned that she was a medium and how her family has always strictly advised her against sharing that information with people. When you work at a casino, you encounter a lot of scammers and generally odd people. I was polite, but tried not to engage with her much on the topic. As we kept walking, she said something to me about my sister. I stopped and asked her how she knew my sister. She didn't, 
but started talking to me at great lengths about my family. At this particular time, my sister was going through a very difficult time in her life that was impacting our family as a whole. I was skeptical, but curious. As she went on, I was careful to neither confirm or deny anything, but just listen to what she had to say. She went into great detail about how my father, mother, and even I played into the current situation. She even became visibly emotional, as if she could feel what my mother was feeling. I was utterly astonished as she told me that I, being the oldest and most diplomatic in my family dynamic, needed to be more outspoken with everyone involved. Everything she had told me was undeniably accurate and insightful, but then she shifted her focus. She told me about somebody I worked with and went into great detail about what this person looked like and how they felt about me. She talked about the dynamic between us and advised me to take caution. At this point, she had lost me. I couldn't think of a single person or relationship in my working life that fit that description. I began becoming more skeptical again, and I reminded her that I needed to get back to work and to keep walking toward our destination. She kept talking to me as we walked, and I began to once again find myself astonished, not just to what she was telling me, but also how she would go about it. Her body language, expressions, her emotional energy. As we got closer, she abruptly stopped walking. When I noticed, I did as well, and I turned back to her. Before I could say anything, she placed her palm at the base of my sternum, above my belly button, just below where my rib cage started. I immediately noticed a physical sensation. I became paralyzed and almost felt like she was stealing the breath from my body. I started becoming hyper aware of my surroundings, the lights and dings from the electronic games, the mass amounts of people walking by, but everything seemed to be in slow motion, almost like I was leaving my body. It could have only been a few seconds, it could have been 20 minutes, I don't know. But I felt as if I couldn't breathe, and I felt weak in my knees. I started to feel like I was on the verge of passing out. Casino security saw this encounter and approached us. When security interrupted us to ask what was going on, it must have startled her because I felt this shockwave through my entire body. She jerked her hand back and began apologizing profusely to me. As soon as she pulled her hand back, I was able to breathe again and gain control of my body. I was completely freaked out. It must have been visible because security kept asking me if I was okay. I assured them that everything was fine and they walked off. I turned back to the woman who was still apologizing and she said, if you don't do something about that ulcer, it's going to kill you. I was so freaked out, but I told her thanks that I had to get back to work now and I quickly headed back to my office. Not only was I in a bizarre headspace, but I was noticeably completely void of physical energy. The entire experience was the most profound encounter of my life, and I will never forget those words or the physical sensation. I was having a lot of stomach issues at the time, but I was way too afraid to get medical verification of an ulcer. I had already previously suspected it, and it was a potential side effect of the medication I was on at the time. But if that wasn't bizarre enough on its own, it gets even weirder. The encounter happened nearly 10 years ago, and it has sat with me ever since. But recently, I was reflecting back on it. I realized that the second part about the coworker, the part that initially made no sense at all, all of a sudden did. That entire situation played out in my life a few years ago. The description of the person and the very specific details were 100% spot on from what was described to me 10 years prior. I even realized that the entire situation was initiated nearly seven years to the day from the moment that this woman described it to me. Not only were the two incidents separated by seven years, but the person she had described I hadn't even met yet and was in an entirely different state at a whole other company at the time. I don't really know what to make of this. I'm open to this kind of thing, but I've always approached these situations skeptically. 
Still, I would love to hear what anyone else has to say about it and see what you might think it was. Coyote, and after she passed, Sita was never the same. She was grumpy and preferred to be by herself, but I would annoy her with my love anyway. One night, I was carrying her in a wicker basket with some blankets. I would bring her room to room with me as I cleaned up. I'd been petting her and listening to her purr when she suddenly stopped moving. I was maybe 12, and I remember praying for the first time to bring her back to me. It was awful to bring her out to my mom and tell her she had passed. I had a tradition that whenever a pet died, I would make a concrete headstone with little marbles and their name on it. I had set it on our kitchen counter to dry and I left it there. The next morning I checked on it and found a small piece of her fur right in the center. I went around to everyone and asked if they had placed it there and they all said that they had not. It felt like she was giving me one last piece of her. I kept it in a tiny knick-knack tea kettle it lives there with a few of her whiskers that I had found weeks after her passing. I feel like she came to give me one last gift. This happened over 30 years ago so I'll explain the incident as best as I can remember. When I was three, my grandma on my maternal side died of a heart attack. While at the funeral, the adults were outside talking, smoking cigarettes, etc. Myself, my older brother, and another family member close to our age were told to stay inside to keep us out of conversations that we didn't need to hear, according to my parents. Well, the other family member convinced my brother that locking me in the viewing room with those red lights over the coffin on was a good idea. Once they locked me in, the other family member called through the door that grandma needed to take me with her because I was her favorite. I screamed and cried as loud as my little self could and some adults took me outside to my parents. I was told that they were just playing and that even though grandma loved me, she was never going to take me away. They were doing their best to soothe a very upset three-year-old. Later that year, we moved two states away from there. One night in the new house, four years later, I woke up in the middle of the night. According to my mom, this was very unusual. I heard a song that only my grandma sang to me. I sat up looking around and I see the lid on my old toy box opening by itself. Once it was fully open, I saw what looked like my grandma standing slowly from inside that box. She turned slowly and creepily around to look at me. I was frozen in place. I couldn't cry, I couldn't scream, I couldn't even move. Then she started walking toward me. She stepped close to the bed and said, I came to get you. You were always my favorite, and now I want you to be with me. Somehow I found my voice and screamed. My mom came running in, and just before she got to my room, my grandma said, I'll come back for you again, and vanished. My mother came in, asking who I was talking to. I told her everything. My mom let me sleep in the living room for a few nights while she got rid of my toy box. The toy box was the last thing my grandma had ever given me before she died. To this day, I have no idea what happened. All I know is that wasn't grandma. To start off, I'm not really a believer in the paranormal. I mean, sure, creepy things do happen, 
but never to the point of me thinking that it was definitely a ghost or whatever. But one night, a few days ago, it was nearly midnight, and I was on my bed, thirsty during a heat wave. So I get up, ready to get a Gatorade, and I open my door. I see this black and brown shadow figure. It was crouching, was six to seven feet tall, and zoomed across my living room into my dining room. To top things off, my cat saw it, definitely, because the cat reacted. So, I go get my Gatorade, cause ain't no demon gonna stop me from quenching my thirst, and I get back to my room and think about it. It couldn't have been my door, it opens inward, and it couldn't have been one of my cats. Here's the worst part. My stepdad lived in a house with some paranormal stuff going on. I thought maybe it followed him. Maybe he brought some kind of demon into the house. Maybe I'm crazy. Maybe I'm haunted. I really don't know. But another experience was at my dad's house. I was in my room at the end of the hall, and I heard the slider in the kitchen open. Keep in mind it's at night, and everyone is in their respective rooms. So, being the guy I am, I take out a pocket knife and investigate. As soon as I open my bedroom door, the bathroom door next to my room slams shut. Now, I don't know if this could be connected to the first story, but it was really, really creepy nonetheless. I have no idea what's going on, but that's my story. I was working a part-time job at a church at the time of this event, and it was at the end of the day, so I was cleaning up and getting ready to lock it up for the day. For context, this church is very old, and there are graves on the property that date from the 1860s. The place has burned down twice. I go to the church's kitchen to grab my lunch bag from the fridge, and when I walk through the door, out of the corner of my eye, I see a woman at the counter to my right. I thought it was my boss, but the fridge was straight ahead, so I walked forward and grabbed my stuff. I turned around and there was no one there. I was alone in the kitchen and the door didn't open, but there was someone there. I made a conscious effort not to look because I'm kind of socially awkward. I thought about it and realized, wait, that woman was wearing a white dress with a pink floral pattern on it. How on earth could that have been my boss? She only ever wears jeans and sweaters. I kind of freaked out and I went inside and locked up the church and I told my friend about it who's been going to the church for a long time. I didn't tell him what she was wearing, just that I had seen a woman that I didn't recognize. He told me that people like to joke about the church being haunted, but that there was no way I saw a ghost in broad daylight like that. It was the light playing tricks on me. Sure. After my job was done, I forgot all about the interaction until I got a text from my friend. It said, bro, was that woman you saw working at the counter wearing a white dress with a pink floral pattern? I never described the clothing to him. So we both saw the same woman in the kitchen cooking. Our theory is that back in the day, the women would do all the work in the kitchen for church services. She must have been buried on the church grounds and she was just there, working in the kitchen for decades or even a century, continuing on with the work she had always done. Last Thursday in the early morning, my dog passed away. It was really hard on the family, and it was especially hard on me. I remember after the at-home euthanasia company picked her up, I sat down where she had last laid, and I just cried my eyes out. I remember wishing out loud that I could hold her one more time, to play with her, to pet her, to run around and just enjoy her company. After I felt better composed, I got up and spent the remainder of my afternoon looking at pictures of her with my girlfriend. Later that night, my mom came home and mentioned that there was a stray in the front yard. 
Although I was still grieving, I wanted to make sure that the dog outside got the right owner. Thankfully, it didn't take much to help out. She was timid, but a few treats sealed the deal. She came into my backyard willingly, and I started posting around to find the owner. She enjoyed my company from the get-go. She encouraged us to pet her and hug her. She latched onto me like a newborn puppy and followed me throughout the backyard. We weren't confident enough to let her in the house, so she slept outside. She slept, by choice, in the same spot that my dog would sleep. Apparently, the dog had been spotted at our neighborhood park and a family had been trying to get her for the past few days. They tried everything, food, treats, snacks, but she wouldn't budge. The family asked how I managed to get her to come to me, and I just said that it didn't take much. They took her off my hands and checked her into the nearest vet. She left willingly and didn't look back. She was wagging her tail until she passed my block. I can't take her in, because honestly, I'm not ready for a dog yet. However, it's crazy how a brief moment with this dog eased me in so many ways. Everyone I tell mentions that my dog probably sent over a guardian dog to ease me. That stray came to me readily and let me pet her, hold her, play with her, things no one else could get her to do. It's the last few things that I wish to do with Bay before she passed on, and I don't think that that's a coincidence. These experiences happened two to three years ago. I was around 13 to 14 at the time. The first experience occurred to me and my younger sister. It was around nine o'clock at night, not too late, but we were folding clothes and I heard a faint knock. I asked my sister if she had heard the knock, but she said no. I just shook it off because I thought it might've been a relative or something. But about 10 minutes later, we hear the knock again, and this time my sister heard it too. This time it was way louder. I mean, you might think that that's not scary or creepy, but the knock came from our window, and the window is only accessible to someone in the home, because the window is in our backyard and no outsider has access to the backyard. We immediately bolted out of the room because we were frightened. The next experience happened only to me. It was also around 9 p.m. at night, and I had gone into the kitchen for a cup of water. While I was pouring water, I heard a loud knock on the living room window. I got so scared that I yelled for my mom, who was in the other room at the time. She checked outside, but all she found was a rock. Everyone who lived in the house at the time said that someone had gotten a rock and thrown it at the window as a joke, but I disagreed. I disagreed because the rock that my mom found was only in our front yard, and our front yard gate was closed at the time. You need a key to be able to open it. I don't know though. What do you guys think? Was it a ghost or a person? We used to have a mimic when I was in college. People would hear or see me or my husband when we weren't there. After moving to our apartment in another state, we didn't have many experiences and assumed that it had stayed with the house. A couple of months ago, we moved into a different apartment and we've been having some odd occurrences. Things are moved around and reorganized. We hear or see each other when we aren't there stuff we used to see in our old place. The mimic has always been kind of helpful, so we don't really mind having it around. The first weekend in our new place, my shoes were organized without either of us touching them. Stuff I needed has popped up on the counters in plain sight. This morning, I was brushing my teeth as my husband was making coffee, and I heard him say, we're almost out of milk. I assumed he meant creamer since we don't have regular milk in the house and he was making coffee. When I went to make a cup, surely enough, we were almost out of creamer. I went into the home office and asked my husband if he had meant creamer before, 
when I heard him say we were low on milk, and he just gave me this weird face. He insisted that he never said that. My friendly neighborhood mimic, I guess, just wanted me to be prepared when I was going to make a cup of coffee. I've had a couple of ghost encounters that really messed me up, but this one in particular was the worst. My mom was dating this guy, who wasn't like a super country guy, but not like a normal country guy either. He also had a son, who I still stay in close contact with to this day. Basically, almost every Sunday, we would go out to my stepdad's mom's house. She lived in the middle of the woods, but not too secluded like there were other houses in the area. But directly across the dirt road, there was this abandoned house that pretty much looked exactly what you would expect an abandoned house to look like. My stepbrother and I would go in there every once in a while just for fun, and we would see some pretty weird stuff, like a random chair in the middle of a room, a cooler full of dead roses. But one day, we were headed in there like usual, but I took one step in and I wanted to throw up. My stepbrother kept going and was telling me it was fine and to just come in, but I was not going in there. A couple of minutes of talking go by and all of a sudden my brother's face turns pale as hell. He drops his water bottle and he runs out without saying a word. I follow him, asking him to slow down and he says that we're never going back in there again. When I asked why, he said that he heard a voice whisper in his ear and tell him to run. We never told our parents until like two years later. At the time, we were 12. And true to his word, we never went back in there again. I was around 12 years old. It was during the summer when school was off. My parents would work during the day, so it was just me and my sister, home alone. One day we were in the basement watching a movie. I had to go to the bathroom. As I came out, I saw someone run into the storage room, which was between the stairs and the laundry room. I thought it was my sister hiding from me, so I started yelling her name as I approached the door. I looked in and I saw a white figure dash to the side from behind the furnace. I walked in and started yelling my sister's name again. I was just about to go look behind the furnace when my sister said, what, from right behind me. I asked her if she had just been in the storage room and she said no. I told my sister what happened and we were so scared we ran upstairs and spent the rest of the day hiding in our room until my parents came home. My boyfriend passed at the end of March, and I haven't felt his presence until lately. I'm pregnant, and I've been in my nesting phase lately. I was setting up the bassinet and figuring out what sheets to buy, getting ready for bed. I put a blanket down in the bassinet, because my cat likes to sit in it, not for when the baby gets here. And I looked out my window, which looks into my neighbor's closet. My neighbor has stained glass for privacy but I saw my boyfriend's silhouette in the window. I shook it off as somebody else in the closet, but when I looked back up a couple of minutes later, it was still there, with a hand pressed on the glass. I couldn't mistake it. It was him, down to the haircut. I started crying immediately. And then I smelled his scent and felt a warm, comforting feeling. It's been a couple of months since he passed, and I've always been sensitive to energy shifts and the paranormal. I found it weird that I hadn't felt his presence, but the closer I get to my due date, the more I feel him around. So 
So in 2019, my family and I are driving back from Narrabeen when we drove on Wakehurst Parkway. There's a legend about that road that a lady in all white is on it. And if you're not careful, she can appear inside your car. So we're driving back at around 9 p.m. and we're in the thick bush area. My mother, brother, sister, and I were asleep. My father was all alone. According to my dad, he was driving when he saw a lady all in white on the side of the road. He freaked out, but continued driving on. But then he saw the same lady two minutes later on the same side of the road. My father told us he was so freaked out that he tried to drive faster. Two minutes later, the same lady. After we got home, he told us what he had seen. And personally, I couldn't sleep for a couple of nights. When I was in my late teens, early 20s, I was staying at a friend's house. It was a big and old house that didn't give off any weird vibes. That afternoon, I was walking through the living room, which was pitch black, curtains closed and no lights on. I ended up tripping on a vacuum cleaner. I was about to fall when I felt a hand on my chest push me back up. No one was there. I was a little freaked, but brushed it off and went on with my life. I went to bed later and woke up during the night to see a lady sitting at the end of my bed. She was wearing an old-looking nurse uniform with a white bandana. She was just watching me. I didn't feel scared or unsafe. It was just a calm feeling. I closed my eyes, and when I opened them again, she was gone. That morning, I told my friend and her parents about it. Her mother went to grab a book from the shelf full of old photos. Their house used to be a place where people would come to give birth like a hospital, but specifically for birthing. While looking through the book, I saw a picture of the midwife that I had seen. It was an odd experience, but not at all creepy. I like to think that she was just making sure I was okay and was keeping me safe. Last October, my best friend, Tanner, died unexpectedly. I don't need to go into too many details because they're not relevant to the story, but it was easily one of the hardest hitting losses I've ever experienced. He and I shared a very close and special bond and had overcome a lot of life together. He had moved in with our mutual friend, Beth, and her boyfriend several months prior to passing away so I would constantly come over to hang out with everyone as I lived nearby. One summer day, we all had a giant Nerf gun fight together in their front yard. I distinctly remember making eye contact with Tanner and having this strange gut feeling at the time that this was going to be a bittersweet moment. But I brushed it off as just being sad that summer was coming to a close. I felt uneasy that he had at the same time a sad, longing look in his eyes that I did. It began to get dark out. After collecting as many darts as we could, we headed inside and Tanner declared, this isn't over yet. A month later, after noticing many strange behaviors, Beth and her boyfriend made the heavy decision to call Tanner's mom and have her convince him to go back to rehab. Three months later, Tanner was dead. I've moved out of state since, but I always go back to visit Beth when I'm home. One day, after a heavy snowfall, I pulled into Beth's driveway. Just as I hopped out of my car, Beth came to the door to greet me. Something yellow popped out against the fresh snowfall, immediately catching both of our attention. We looked down and directly on her front step, perfectly placed in the untouched snow, with no footsteps around, was a nerf dart. Well played, buddy. Well played.
Back in 2013, when I was 28, I was traveling through Jujuy, a remote northwestern province of Argentina for school. We traveled through a few remote villages along the Andes Basin, which consisted of crazy dramatic rock formations. The first village was called Purmamarca. The place we stayed at did not have electricity. It only had cold running water and no Wi-Fi. I must admit it was pretty awesome living off the grid and actually conversing with friends and telling stories by the fire. Now, fast forward two days. We arrive at the village of Tilkara, a couple hours north. The hostel we stayed at was quite a bit more modern, yet still pretty rustic. Tilkara was yet another beautiful dust bowl of a village, surrounded by colorful dramatic mountains and alien geography. When I say alien geography, I literally felt like we were on another planet while driving through it. This place did have TV, Wi-Fi, and warm water. We did a lot of exploring that day, hung out with llamas, visited ruins, things like that. That night, we had a traditional Argentine asado with our group around the fire in the common area, outside. My roommates, two girls from Illinois and one girl from Germany, all turned in early for the night at around 11. I stayed out for about an hour afterward, hanging out with my teachers and talking. They were drinking Fernet, a nasty, minty Argentine drink that I had tried previously and will never touch again. The following day was going to be a long one, since we were hiking up a mountain, so I did not partake in libations. I started getting tired, so I decided to turn in as well. My roommates were all laying down watching TV, and as soon as I got in, I got ready for bed. Shortly after, we all decided to call it a night. I fell right asleep. Later, I randomly woke up because I had to pee and I checked my phone. It was 5.37 a.m. As I set my phone back on the nightstand, I suddenly felt something staring at me from behind. The pull of the gaze was so strong I could feel it through the blanket. It was almost like a magnetic energy. I could feel anger and negativity emanating from it. I felt frozen in place for a few seconds. I managed to turn and peek over the blanket to see a dark figure standing at the right corner of the end of my bed. The figure was about six feet tall with really broad shoulders. I couldn't make out any distinguishable features like eyes, etc. Its body was black but seemed to consist of static. The static was like that of a TV channel, where the signal is out. Black and dark gray instead of black and white. And it moved a lot slower. It just stood there, not budging at all. I laid there for what seemed like an eternity, frozen, too scared to move. Suddenly, I felt the same pull from my left side. I turned and I saw a similar figure, but slightly shorter, standing at the foot of the German girl's bed. The one and only small window in our room was above our bed, casting light straight ahead, so I know it was not a trick of the light. Multiple times I have thought maybe I was dreaming, but I couldn't have felt more awake. If I was dreaming, it was the most realistic lucid dream I have ever had. I laid there staring at both figures, casting my gaze from left to right, until I did what any normal person would try to do to protect themselves from scary things at night. I pulled the covers over my head. I'm not sure why I was not more proactive, considering the fact that there were two strange beings in the room, but I didn't budge. I waited for what seemed like another eternity. The entire time I had to pee like a racehorse. Eventually, the presence of whatever beings were in the room gradually faded, and the embarrassment of possibly peeing the bed forced me to peek up from the covers to see if the figures were still there. They were gone. I waited for a few seconds to see if they were somewhere else in the room, but when I didn't see anything, I got up, raced to the bathroom, and turned on the light. 
I peed while peeking my head out the door to make sure nothing was there. And afterward, I ran to the bed, hid under the covers, and fell asleep with the light still on. The next day, I woke up and still considered that maybe the entire thing was just a weird, bad dream. The two girls in the bed across from me asked why the light was left on in the bathroom, and I proceeded to tell them what had happened. The German girl was taking a shower at the time. Their response was to laugh at me and jokingly ask me what kind of drugs I was on and how much I had to drink. Granted, I was not much of a drinker. I hadn't had anything to drink that night, but I could see how they came to that conclusion, considering that I was hanging out a little later with people who were drinking. After the German girl got out of the shower, the other two girls, who were still laughing at me, told her about how I had seen a ghost last night. Her face instantly drained of color. She looked over at me and said, you saw them too? I asked her what she had seen and where and she said that she saw two guys in our room and pointed out the exact locations where I had seen them. I asked her what she did, and she said that she saw them and then tried to just go back to sleep because she was so scared. The general consensus of the girls in our room was that the two men in our group creepily came into our room last night, but I didn't believe that. The body shapes and sizes were not consistent to either of them, and I just couldn't see them doing that in general, but who knows. I told my teachers and the hostel owner of my experiences. The teachers also laughed, but the hostel owner brushed it off and said that it was quite normal and that people saw things there all the time. Just another night in Tilkara. Apparently, that region is quite popular for UFOs and is also on an indigenous burial ground. So, they may have been aliens, or angry native spirits, or something else. It wasn't so much that I could see these beings, but I could feel them. Their presence was one of the strongest things I've ever felt in my life. I felt them before I saw them. If I was ever skeptical of otherworldly beings before, this experience completely changed my mind. Whatever they were, I have zero doubt that they were something from beyond. Beyond where? I have no idea. What's really weird is that when I returned to the United States, I found myself often waking up at 5.37 a.m., multiple times a week. I had never had this happen before that. To this day, it still happens. I used to work as a guide and then as a backup, and even as a field director for several wilderness therapy programs for troubled kids in Arizona, Utah, and Idaho. They were all good jobs, but where I worked in Utah was in the West Desert, south of Dugway. It's possibly the ugliest and creepiest part of Utah. Tons of sketchy stuff happened to us out there. This story happened in 2005. The groups were camped in a really nice area for that part of the desert. It was called Indian Canyon. This spot was so nice, in fact, that in the late 1800s or 1900s, some enterprising pioneer family had built themselves a little homestead with a one-room cabin and a small barn and a cedar pole fence around the perimeter of that little farm. All of that, of course, now was a crumbling, rotten ruin. The cabin, it seemed, had burned down well over 50 years ago, and what remained of the barn was poking out of the grass in two or three foot shards of gray wood scattered all over the nearby vicinity. This week, I was also camped in Indian Canyon, but farther down the road. I was manning the infield emergency response vehicle, or the ERV, better known as backup, a new position that I helped invent when I took a list of things that had gone wrong in the field to the directors 
and explained that because of the horrible response time and spotty satellite phone service, the only reason we weren't shut down or the people weren't dead was because we were lucky, not because we were prepared or efficient at responding to emergencies. Now we had radios and someone listening to them 24 seven, never more than a few minutes away with a vehicle. That's how it worked in theory anyway. One of the boys groups was camped at the mouth of the canyon in the foothills, about two miles away from me. The other just a mile beyond them. The girls were close too. I was camped somewhere in the middle of the canyon on top of a small ridge that had a little jeep track side road branching off of the main dirt road running up the canyon. And the girls were just a couple of ridges over, maybe a mile away, though to drive to them might have to go back out on the main road and take a different jeep trail up to their spot, maybe a five mile trip. I was about a mile and a half below the staff training group that was being held by my then wife, Jessica. There were going to be several groups of parents coming out to visit their kids later in the week. So both the boys groups and the girls groups, all on that side of the mountain, had all elected to stay put for a few days and work on building backpacks and gathering fire sets and a lot of other primitive skills. The training group had been in the field for almost a week and they were getting ready to split up and go join the student groups for the last several days of their training. This left me with less to do than normal. I didn't have to find new sites for groups or drop anyone's water or food. Everyone was well taken care of and no one was moving for several days. I decided to build a sweat lodge next to the creek up near where the new staff were camped. I found the perfect spot well out of sight of the group on a little smooth sandbar right by the water. I got to work. I harvested some long willow saplings that were bendable enough to weave a frame with and arranged them in a 10 foot circle, digging down a foot and a half for each one to anchor it into the sand. I bent them into a dome at least four feet high and 10 feet across and wove the branches together with supporting crossbars until I had a structure that I probably could have stood on without breaking. I walked down to the truck, which I had hidden in some pine trees a quarter of a mile away and hauled a large bin of tarps and cowhides and plastic sheeting, along with my fire set and some other gear up to the lodge. As I was walking back to the creek, I remember feeling like someone was following me, but when I stopped to look, I couldn't see or hear anything. It was a beautiful day for July. The morning had started out with some high wispy cloud cover, but that had long since burned off and the noon sun was high overhead. It wasn't yet too hot, however. I was high enough in the mountains that the oppressive heat that I knew was slowly baking the kids groups in the desert below wouldn't reach me for another couple of hours. I set to work placing hides first on my little domed frame I covered those with some tarps and plastic sheeting and secured it all so that I had as close to an airtight and waterproof shelter as possible with only a small arched opening for a door. I secured an old military poncho over the door so that once hot rocks had been placed inside of it, it could be sealed shut and the sweat ceremony could take place. I wanted it as hot as possible. There wouldn't be any children involved in this one so we could go as hot as we wanted. I took the extra time around the base of the lodge to bury all the edges of the coverings deep in the sand. This was as sturdy a shelter structure as I had ever built. It was nice. I spent a good hour gathering sage and juniper and covered the floor of the lodge with a thick padding of the fragrant plants. I did this in part so that it was a soft place to sit for an extended time but mostly I did it because I was intending to invite the new staff down to do a sweat ceremony later to help some of them prepare to meet actual students for the first time. And frankly, a group of unwashed men and women who hadn't showered in a week in July, all crammed inside a sweltering homemade dome tent sweating buckets is a smell that should not be endured without as much sage and juniper as possible. If it was really bad, which it was likely to be, I would rub some of it into my shirt 
and then pull it up over my nose and breathe through that. I went hunting for lava rock. I found an outcropping of some small rounded boulders, perfect for heating on a bonfire and then rolling into the lodge. And I proceeded to gather three onto a tarp. It was heavy, almost too heavy for me to sling over my back and carry, but I managed to make it back to the fire pit I had dug with all three. I left them there and went to gather more. I made this a smaller load because it's not like I was in a hurry. I could take more trips. When I got back to the fire pit, one of my rocks was gone. I just stared at the small depression in the sand where I had placed it minutes before and then looked around for signs that someone, possibly one of the staff from the group, had come and taken it. No tracks. I looked around again and spotted it by the edge of the creek, 20 feet away. I had that feeling again, like I was being watched, but I couldn't see anyone in the trees. I walked over and retrieved my stone, the heaviest one I had carried, and put it back with the others. Maybe it had rolled there through flat, soft, dry sand? Unlikely. I gathered a bunch more rocks, and none of them went missing, and then I built a fire. As I worked, that weird feeling came back, only this time it felt more ominous, like it was mad at me for being there. I stood up, determined to walk out into the woods and find whoever it was. The radio, which I kept on and strapped to my belt, had been silent all day, but suddenly, it crackled to life. Brian, in the boys' group, was doing evening check-in a little early so that they could do their day hike without having to stop and contact me. After we talked, I felt more normal again. I cooked some rice and beans for dinner, and as they cooled off, I piled my stones, probably 30 of them, into a cairn in the center of the fire, and then just piled on all the dry wood and brush I could gather. I took my knife out of my sheath, because that feeling was back, still worse this time. As soon as my fire became almost irresponsibly large, I saw someone moving fast through the trees, straight toward me. I tensed, then relaxed. Will, a seasoned staff working in the training group with Jessica and Katie, came running down the creek. He stopped when he saw me and my sweat lodge and my 10 foot tall flames and broke into a huge grin. I thought it was a wildfire, he said. Some of the new girls are panicking. Nope, just an epic sweat lodge, I said. I was planning on inviting you all down for it when you called in, but I'll consider this your check-in. If you guys want to, you're all invited to come sweat. It'll be ready in about half an hour. Perfect, he said. They're just finishing up dinner. I'll go let Katie in just now and we'll be down. He turned to walk away. Hey, Will? He turned back around. Did you guys lose track of any of the new guys today? Or did one of you three come down this way? He thought for a moment and said, No, I don't think so. Why? That's nothing, I said. I just thought someone might have come looking for me when I was out gathering rocks. Some of my stuff was in a different place than I remember leaving it. That's all. He looked at me with an odd expression. Weird, he said finally. I'll ask everyone, but we've kept pretty busy today, so I don't know when someone would have had time to come down this far. It's okay, I said. Don't stress it. I was just wondering. See you in a few minutes. The other two kids' groups radioed me shortly after Will walked off. It was more like an hour before the staff group finally trudged into my sandy clearing. Some of them looked excited, and some of them looked confused at my dome of plastic and sand, and at my pile of glowing red boulders on the still blazing fire, and at the stack of blue five-gallon water jugs that I'd hauled down from the truck for the experience. We thought we were going to die in a forest fire, one of the new girls, Carol Sue, said accusingly. 
She looked extra smelly. I pulled some essential oils out of my possibles bag. A possibles bag is just a type of leather purse we make on the trail. We call it that to disguise the fact that we're grown men who carry around purses. Put some of this on your wrists and neck. It will help you keep a good frame of mind in the sweat. How many of you have done this before? A handful of them raised their hands. Inside of the circle of the lodge is a sacred place. We will do four sessions, going longer and longer each time. We will dedicate each session to a different part of our lives, our histories, our families, our struggles, and our choices. Try to only speak from the heart about these things. It will be very hot once we begin pouring water on the rocks, and the heat will make it very difficult to speak anyway. So only speak if it is important. Katie and Will were already rolling the superheated rocks into the lodge, using some long willow poles I had made. I gave Jess a side hug. The trainees didn't know we were married, and we had found it best not to let kids or people new to the wilderness group know, because it could have become a distraction from the experience if they got caught up in our personal lives. So, side hug was all. As far as they knew, we were just co-workers. I took out a dried sage smudge and lit it on the fire and did the ritual smoke cleansing for each of them as they entered the hallowed ground. I made the last minute decision not to go into the sweat lodge. That last boys group had a student that was a little bit of trouble and I was worried I would end up having to take an emergency radio call about a runner in the middle of someone's heartfelt speaking about their issues with their family or their past. Also, the smell. Also, something just felt off. This was a perfect spot and a perfect time for a sweat lodge ceremony, but it felt not wrong exactly, just off somehow. Instead, I whispered my choice and that maybe I would join the next session to Katie as she was the last to enter. And I sealed the door up behind them burying the edge of the poncho in the sand like the rest of the construction. I stood by the fire for a minute or two and felt hot. So I walked in the water down the narrow stream about a hundred yards and just looked at the stars that were slowly becoming more and more visible in the darkening twilight. I stood there for at least 10 minutes enjoying the changing sky. I heard a twig snap somewhere to my left and the crickets went silent. There was definitely somebody away up there in the trees. I stared hard and could not see anybody at first, but there was a small dark shadow under a pine, maybe 30 or 40 feet away. Too dark for this early in the evening. Was that a girl in the shadow? It looked like a small Native American girl with two long braids and some kind of headband. I called out to her, but she didn't move. She seemed to be glaring at me. And the longer I stood there, the worse I felt, like the warmth from the air around me was being sucked away. So I took a deep breath, and I did what I always do in the woods when something unknown scares me. I ran at it. Whoever was there took off fast, and I chased them. I lost them quickly enough, I'm not a runner, but I was sure they had been headed in the direction away from my little creekside sweat lodge. I must have gone an eighth of a mile, almost to the road, when I heard all the staff at the sweat lodge scream behind me. My blood ran cold, and I turned on my heel and sprinted back up the canyon. I almost missed the sweat lodge clearing when I came to it because nothing that I saw made sense. The fire was out, not even a glow. The sweat lodge was gone. The tarps had all been pulled and ripped off and they and the hides were flung out in a wide circle on the ground in the bushes and in the water. The frame was uprooted and folded over on its side to one side of the sandbar and all the new and experienced staff were sitting stunned in a circle 
on a padding of sage and juniper around a pile of cold rocks. What happened? I yelled as I ran up. After a moment, Katie answered. We were just sitting here, starting to pour water on the rocks to heat things up, and we started talking a little bit about what it means to know your personal history. The walls of the sweat lodge started shaking, and we thought you were outside trying to get in. It stopped for a minute, and Jess called your name, but you didn't answer. And we had just poured some more water on the rocks when the whole lodge went cold. Like, really cold. And it sounded like a massive windstorm blew in and ripped the whole thing off of us, frame and all, and threw it into the trees. I didn't know what to do, so I grabbed my bag and got out every flashlight I had. We started checking each other for injuries. I lied to them through my teeth and told them that it was a microburst windstorm and that they happened sometimes in Utah and that they were lucky nobody got hurt and so on. Amidst the skeptical looks from the three who knew me, I got Jessica and Will to start taking the stunned newbies back to camp, but Katie stayed. Katie, who had been with me through so many other unexplainable things out here, knew what I was doing. She could tell I wasn't saying something. The fire is out, like it's out cold, and it was a thousand degrees 20 minutes ago. And the rocks that were glowing hot 20 minutes ago feel like they've been sitting in the creek, she said. What are you not saying? I took a deep breath. I just tried to chase down a Native American girl who apparently can run unnaturally fast in the dark. Katie sat down hard. I looked at her, but she didn't say anything, so I continued. Today, while I was gathering rocks for the lodge, I felt like someone was watching me the whole time, and I swear I'm not making this up, but I set down that really big rock, you know, the first one you rolled into the circle, and I walked away for a few minutes. When I returned, it was over by the creek, like someone came and moved it, but there were no tracks, and it couldn't have rolled there. And then after you all went into the sweat lodge, I walked down to the creek and heard something in the trees. It took me a minute to spot her, but she was hiding in a shadow under a tree. I think I chased her for maybe 30 seconds when you all started screaming and I ran back up here. What Katie said next made me sit down too. Did she have two braids and a headband? I nodded slowly. Early this morning, like three, Jessica woke everybody up and said it was going to rain and that we needed to build a shelter. There were no clouds last night, I said. I know, said Katie, but she woke us all up and insisted that we needed to build a shelter and she wouldn't drop it until we all moved closer together and put up some tarps. I like to see the stars if I wake up, so I moved in close just in case, but I didn't get under a tarp. Neither did Will or Josh, and he's one of the new guys. Well, this morning, just before it got light, I had a really disturbing dream where I felt like I was awake in my sleeping bag and was staring up into the trees above me. And there was this little Native American girl with two braids and a blue-gray headband up in the tree over my face, just staring at me. I knew I was dreaming, but I couldn't move or wake up. I was only able to move when Josh, on the other side of the shelter, yelled and sat up. I thought it was just a horrible dream, until I talked to Jess about the rain last night. She admitted to me that she hadn't been worried about rain, but that she had been dead asleep when she felt somebody reach into her sleeping bag and shove her head to the side. She panicked and laid there and pretended like she was still sleeping, but they knelt over her face for a few minutes. She said she was terrified to open her eyes. When she felt them leave, she waited for a few minutes and then woke everyone else up. I was wondering why she slept in the middle of everyone. Now it makes sense. I was quiet. Katie spoke again. 
Before breakfast, I asked Josh why he yelled and sat up. I was grateful he did, but was curious as to why. He told me that he'd had a horrible nightmare about a little Native American girl, and when he thought he woke up, he saw her running at him. He yelled and she jumped over his head and took off, and that's when he really woke up and sat up. He was surprised that I had heard him yell. He thought he was still asleep at that point, and he dreamed the yelling part. I didn't tell Jess or Josh what happened to me, and I didn't tell them about each other. But at breakfast, Will told all of us about this horrible dream he had about a little girl dying in that cabin when it burned down. We all freaked out. It's all we've been talking about today. Half of the group didn't believe us, and Carol Sue, the loud annoying one, has told everybody that we're just trying to haze the new guys. Even Josh, who's a new guy, is in on it, apparently. And then the sweat lodge thing happened. With what you just told me, I don't think any of us were dreaming. We were quiet for a long time. I think we should move camp down the road tomorrow, I finally said. I'll clean up this mess in the morning. Katie just nodded and stood up. Oh, and Katie? It's probably a good idea for everyone to be under the shelter to sleep tonight. And also, maybe don't light another fire. I'm guessing the one at your group site is out too. She sighed tiredly and walked off into the dark. I just sat there for a while and then slowly made my way back to the truck. I didn't feel like anyone was watching me anymore, but that didn't stop me from sleeping in the cab with the doors locked for the rest of the week. This is my favorite paranormal story, so I wanted to share. When I first moved to Orlando, I got a job at a local company and I needed to find a place to live. At the time, I was renting a room from a nice older couple. However, I was also getting married, so I needed to find a place for both of us to live. Those who live in Orlando know how expensive it can be, and I'm not much of an apartment guy. So finally, we found this nice little house. And when I say little, I mean little. Anyway, the landlord gave us a great deal. He didn't really want to spend any time fixing the place up because it wasn't worth it. After all, it was really small and really old. They had just moved his wife's mother to an elderly home and he did fix the electrical and plumbing. I agreed that I would paint and fix things up so long as the basics worked. He was a really nice landlord and we got along great. A few weeks after we moved in, the wife came by and let us know that they would be away for a bit. It turns out her mom passed away a few days prior and they were taking her back to the old country, as she put it. I felt bad. I didn't know she was that sick and we moved into her house. After that, nothing seemed out of the ordinary, but the air about the house did change a little, or at least I thought it did. Shortly after, I got married and we settled into our daily lives. I was working on the front porch one day when I found a small brooch under one of the rotten boards. It was pretty nice, so I brought it inside and placed it on the mantel. I figured I would give it to the landlord the next time I saw him, figuring it was most likely either Lillian's, his mother-in-law's, or his wife's. That was when things started to get weird. The first thing I started noticing, or more to the point, my wife noticed and blamed me for, was that the keepsakes from our wedding got moved around. They were never where she left them. I told her that I had nothing to do with moving them. But her being her, she wasn't having any of it. So we moved them back. A few days later, we come home from dinner and there they were, rearranged again. 
I looked over at her and said, okay, how did I do it this time? The brooch was still there in the same place on the mantel, but everything else had been moved around. This happened a few more times until my wife finally just got over it and left them wherever they were. One day, I was dusting and I came across the brooch on the mantel. I looked at it and a breeze went by. I tried to tell myself it was just the fan, but that got me thinking about all the odd things that had started happening. I started to think that maybe the events were Lillian's doing. I asked my wife what she thought, and she said that I was crazy. She said, do you really think the ghost of the old lady that lived here is haunting the house and moving our wedding stuff around? I said, well, yeah. She gave me that look and walked away. Anyway, the following weekend, the landlord came by to mow and I went outside to give back the brooch, thinking maybe that would change things. His wife was in the truck reading a book and I walked over and handed the brooch to her. Well, she turned about 10 shades of white and looked up at me and asked where I'd found it. I told her that I found it under the porch when I was fixing the floor. She said that it had been her mother's and one day she, the daughter, the wife of the landlord, had been outside playing with it and had lost it. Her mother, Lillian, was very mad at her for having played with it and for losing it. She smiled and the color returned to her face. She hugged me and then I walked back to the house. As I walked up to the front, I looked at the house and noticed that in the front window, there was a shadow behind the lace curtains. It looked like a person. As I walked closer, I tripped over a rock, and when I got back up, the person wasn't there. I went into the house and looked around, didn't see anything. So I moved on, thinking it was a trick of the light through the lace. A few days later, I get home and my wife starts rambling, asking if I smelled the flowers. She also thought we had mice or rats because she kept hearing movement. I told her I didn't smell the flowers. I kind of poked her a bit about it, and I asked her if it sounded like little feet or footsteps. She looks at me and then says, footsteps. After that, the events get more frequent and interesting. I'd be sitting on the couch, and I would see out of the corner of my eye movement or a change of light. Not quite a shadow, but almost going from the kitchen to the bathroom which is a straight shot. There isn't any light that can move way back there. There were other things, like strange sounds of things moving in the kitchen or the back bedroom. A lot of footsteps. The whole house is hardwood floors and it really carries. I decided that Lillian was still here even after the brooch event. Maybe she was happy that I gave it back to her daughter but it was still her house, so I figured she was well within her rights to live there too. And besides, I loved the way she messed with my wife. She's so easy. It even got to the point where sometimes I would talk to Lillian. I never got a response back, and that was before cell phones or voice recorders were as high tech as they are now. I'm not sure who she messed with more, me or my wife. We stayed in that house for six years and had two kids there before we moved on to another city. Shortly after we moved out, the landlord called and asked if anything strange had happened to us while we were in the house. I told him that his mother-in-law was still around and that she was super cool. He then said that's what he thought because they were in there repainting and running ceiling fans and they both had run-ins with something strange. I told him that she was good to us and that we miss living there. I hung up the phone and that was the last time I ever heard from him. I found out a few years later from some friends that the house was torn down and a new house had been put up in its place that was way bigger than the original. I was a bit sad, but then I thought that Lillian might not like that very much and I hope she rearranges everything in the new house and drives the owners crazy like she did my wife. A 
A family member bought this little box with a mirror inside, like a jewelry box, at an antique store. She looked at it and walked about 20 feet away from it, but then was drawn back to the object, looked at it closer, thought it was a great price, and decided to buy it. After bringing it home today, it sat in the garage for a few hours. Later on, she went outside to clean it and wash it out. She brought it into the home, into a room near the kitchen, and left it there on the table. She took several photos of the object on the table and then immediately went into the kitchen to clean the dishes. While cleaning dishes, she felt an intense force rushing up on her to grab her. She felt the actual pressure on her left side from the disembodied person coming up on her. She heard something make a sound in her left ear. She said that she can't remember the exact sound, but when she originally told me, it was almost like a negative, ah. It wasn't a high-pitched yell or anything, somewhere in the middle. It made her jump and made her let out a loud shrieking sound. It was an intense, immediate feeling of panic when it happened, she said. The feeling went away only after telling any negative spirits and energies to leave and that they were not welcome there. She said it out loud several times and in the garage and inside and outside the house. She placed a Bible on the object and held a cross. At first, when it happened, she thought somebody was trying to play a trick on her in the house. The feeling of a male figure, she actually thought it was her husband coming up on her to mess with her. But there was no one around. The closest person was in the bathroom, quite a distance away, and another person was on a totally separate floor of the house. After hearing the shrieking and yelling sound she made, the family member in the bathroom quickly came into the kitchen and asked what had just happened. This all happened very quickly, around 5.40 p.m. local time. This is not the first time an object has been purchased, brought home, and then very strange things started happening. For example, an antique wooden clock that was purchased in another state would hang on the wall and had a very solid latch that would keep it closed. We would come down several times in the morning and the clock would be completely open as if somebody had moved it over the latch and opened it up. Sometimes the TV would even be turned on to different screens in that same room. But nobody messed with the clock and nobody turned on the TV. You would even hear people yelling out your name as if somebody was calling for you, but no one actually was. After getting rid of that clock, those issues basically completely stopped. Today's example was the most negative feeling of all the paranormal experiences in this home. But again, things felt much better after telling it to leave and that it wasn't welcome. The other experiences did not feel negative, maybe playful or trickster-like, but nothing negative. However, the name calling out has somewhat persisted or continued on. It's still very infrequent though, off and on. While writing the story, there were several electronic glitches where I wasn't able to write it out. Notepad would scroll up by itself and not let me copy the text I wrote, things like that. And while trying to save images, it froze my computer. Maybe it has nothing to do with this and is just a software issue, but who knows? Update. The object has been donated to the Goodwill. She sent texts to four different people after donating it and included an image of the place that it was donated. The images disappeared or showed up blank, or with a note saying that they weren't able to view it. I'm curious as to what your thoughts are as to what's going on here. Any insight, feedback, or comments would be greatly appreciated. I studied at a university in Malaysia. I was away from my family, thousands of miles away. This started very early on when I moved there. Our campus was away from the city. As international students, we would be stretched thin for money to get to the main city, 
so most of my time was spent in my hostel room. One night, around seven or eight, two friends and I were coming in a borrowed car when the car suddenly stopped. We got out to see what was wrong. As soon as we got out, the car started on its own. We thought it must be some kind of mechanical issue. We didn't know anything, so we sat back in. The car stopped again. My friend kept turning the ignition, but it wouldn't budge. We decided to get out and push it. Like I said, we didn't know anything, and the car felt like it was a cement block. The friend driving got out to help, and as soon as he stepped out, the car started again, with the hazard lights flashing and the lights on full beam. We started freaking out. None of us wanted to sit in it now. We waited until a few cars passed, flagged one down, and asked the people to help us. Somehow, we got to campus and just went to our rooms that night. I couldn't sleep. I kept feeling like somebody was in the room with me, moving with me, looking at me. I kept looking up suddenly to catch someone, but there wasn't anyone there. In the morning, I asked the others, but they didn't experience anything. So I shrugged it off and come nightfall, I started to feel uneasy again. I played music in my room, but it didn't go anywhere. I showered, I prayed, I tried to sleep, but still the feeling doesn't go. My bed was up against a wall and I slept facing the wall. The whole night I could feel someone standing behind me, looking at me, willing to turn. This keeps going on for a few days, to the point that I play a TV show in the background and I would wake up after five or six episodes had passed. No matter what I did, the presence didn't go. And then, something happened. One night, I'm struggling to sleep, when I feel something or someone pulling my sheet away. I scramble to hold it, but my body is paralyzed. I can only blink my eyes. I lie there as the whole sheet is pulled off of me, trying to recite something, but then being unable to. That's when the whispering started, like multiple people whispering in slow, angry whispers. I couldn't make out anything. I even wet the bed and then lay there paralyzed for I don't know how long. My phone's alarm went off and I could finally move. This became regular. Then I would have episodes of paralysis and hear these whispers. My grades declined and I was exhausted. One evening, I just picked up my stuff and went to sleep in my friend's room, who was almost always high. He looked at me as I came in and said, who are the other guys? There was no one. I called him a bloody stoner, rolled up and went to sleep. The next morning I wake up for class and he's getting ready too. And he brings it up again. He says, your new friends are weird. They just sat there all night beside you, staring at you, didn't even respond to me. I just looked at him and it did not look like he was joking. At this point he was sober too. I quietly take my classes and call my dad afterwards. He tells me to take one of those small ayatul kursis, some lines from the Quran, and stick it outside my door. So I do that. And that's when the shit hits the fan. I don't want to change my room because it's a long process. I'm angry now because this is my space being invaded. I have the ayatul kursi and I've lost my patience. That night, I sleep soundly until there's a knock on my door. I'm still not sure if everything that happened was real or if I was in a trance. I got up and opened the door and there's a man standing there. I'm not sure if he was old or not. He was very tall with his entire body covered in tattoos. He had no eyes. I'm not sure what they were. He just points to the paper stuck above my door and makes this guttural sound that rocks my literal bones. He keeps pointing at it with this weird scream coming from him. I don't know if anyone else heard it. If it was a dream or what really happened, 
I just know that I removed the paper and he came in. I remember waking up the next morning in my bed, angry at myself. I started finding these small things in my room, dead birds, old bones of small animals, broken combs, sometimes burnt paper. I would just throw it out because now it was a fight with them. Then one night, I decided to stop sleeping facing the bed. This is my room, my space, and I'm not letting them bully me anymore. So loudly I say, in my native tongue, something that means do whatever you can, I'm not going anywhere else. I pray and I go to sleep. I wake up in the middle of the night with all of my room lights on, and I see something that I will never forget. It's the same man offering a Muslim prayer in my room in the wrong direction. He's doing all the same motions. I can hear the sounds, but he's facing the wrong way. I don't know how long I lay there, barely able to breathe and unable to scream until the man sitting there turned around and stretched his arms toward me. But they weren't arms. They were these long black snake-like looking things like they could strangle me in a few seconds. In my heart, all this time I was reciting something. I could feel my tears on my pillow and I lost all memory after that. I woke up in the morning with scratch marks all over my body, like a bunch of cats had been let loose on me. My bed sheet smelt like old blood. That was it for me. I couldn't go on like this anymore. So I contacted my cousin who put me through to somebody I could talk to. That night, I decided to go sleep in a mosque. It's common in Malaysia for guys to wear a, I think he called it a dhoti, but I'm not sure, over shorts if you're praying. I prayed, I used mine as a sheet, and I went to sleep in the mosque's courtyard. It's hard to believe the next part, but I'll leave that up to you. I woke up in the same exact place that our car had gone bust that first night. I woke up to these strangers, shaking me awake, asking me if I was okay. Someone suggested calling the police. Some turned out to be my seniors, and I got a ride back to the hostel with them. After that, I started sleeping with different friends until the scholar was put through to me. He came and spent a few hours in my room, and after asking around a bit, we learned that the student before me who lived there used to practice black magic in the room. He even used to write with his own blood on the walls, and administration just painted a new coat on top of it. I don't know what happened to that room or who got it. I was shifted to another one, quietly, on the condition that I would never speak about it. And that was it. No more sleep paralysis, or whispers, or visits, or scratches, or waking up in new places, or the smell of blood. I still have dreams about it, and to this day, I don't look into mirrors for too long. Years ago, I was living outside of Buffalo, New York, on an old estate on the Lake Erie shore. I rented the carriage house of an old mansion that a doctor and his wife owned. The doctor was a heart surgeon, and they were a well-to-do couple with multiple properties, so they weren't around that often. I liked the solitude of the place, having just gotten divorced, and although the carriage house was slightly decrepit, I loved living there. The mansion overlooked the lake, and my house was closer to the road, off of a private drive that went from one side of the estate to the other. The carriage house had been a servant's quarters for whoever lived in the mansion at the turn of the 20th century. There was an enclosed courtyard outside my door that was bordered by the back of my house, the carriage barn, which had stored carriages back in the horse and buggy days a row of empty horse stalls, and a brick wall with an entrance to the courtyard. It was a very cool place to live. The rent was cheap, and there was a private 150-foot-long beach that was hardly ever used by anybody but me. 
but it was very isolated if there was nobody staying in the mansion. And there weren't any close neighbors, because all of the houses along the road were big estates, and a lot of the rich people living in the area weren't full-time residents. But I was young and brave, and it was a big estate full of decaying spookiness, and I'm a weirdo that likes that kind of stuff. So I was overjoyed to find the place. One night, I was coming home late, around 1 a.m., from a friend's house. Driving down a street a mile or two from my house, I saw a dark figure up ahead, standing close to the road. I thought that was kind of odd, because it was late at night on a weekday, not exactly party time in the Buffalo South Towns. I started to get a little nervous, because the person was standing as if they were waiting for someone to pick them up. As I got closer, I could see they were wearing an unusual black shroud-like thing, long and dark and draped, with part of it wrapped over the person's head to look like a hood. It was similar to someone wearing an abaya or a hijab, only much looser, like a bunch of material just wrapped around somebody's body. It seemed totally inappropriate for what I knew of the people that lived around the area. Nobody ever wore anything like that, and certainly not outside at one o'clock in the morning on a weekday. The person was just standing by the side of the road, looking stooped over and old. I slowed down to a crawl as I approached, worried that the person needed help. Maybe it was an older senile person that had walked out of their house in the middle of the night, confused. When I got close enough to really see the person, she lifted her head and looked my way and I saw that it was my ex-mother-in-law. I was absolutely, positively sure that it was her. The same gray-brown hair, the same eyes, the same enigmatic smile that had always made me wonder what she was thinking about but never saying. She raised her hand and waved at me. Not a stop and help me wave, but more of a gosh, it's good to see you wave. That scared the hell out of me because my mother-in-law had died three years previous to when I was driving down that road. I sped up and kept driving, my hands shaking on the steering wheel. But a few minutes later, and a few deep breaths later, I told myself I should go back and take another look. My mother-in-law had loved me. I couldn't imagine her ghost would appear seeking revenge on me for divorcing her son, who had not treated me well, to say the least. I drove in a square by making left turns and went down the same road again, but there was no one there. I was too freaked out to go back to my spooky carriage house with the weird sounds and hundred-year-old history, with nobody there but me and the ghosts I was convinced probably inhabited the place. So I drove to the local all-night Greek diner and sat there for an hour, drinking coffee and calming my nerves. When I finally drove home and into the courtyard, I could see that something was wrong. My door was standing open. The glass windows were broken. The door was cracked almost all the way through from one side to the other. Someone had destroyed the door to get into that house. The next day, I found a crowbar in the courtyard, thrown off to the side. The only things I noticed missing from the house were just a few pieces of my clothing super creepy, a jar of loose change, and a knife from the kitchen. I was just divorced and not exactly rich. I didn't have much worth stealing. It's very scary when someone breaks into the house you live in, all by yourself in an isolated spot. They must have driven right into the courtyard and would have been hidden from view while they broke down the door. I called the cops. They never caught anyone. With all the upset of the break-in, it wasn't until hours later that I remembered having seen my dead mother-in-law waving at me from the side of the road, dressed like the Grim Reaper. I'm convinced that she somehow appeared to delay me from going home, that if I had driven straight to the carriage house, whoever the person or persons were who had broken my solid wood hundred-year-old door practically in half with a crowbar might have been waiting there for me or I could have surprised them, and that things might have turned out very differently for me.
My family and I live on post at Fort Campbell, Kentucky, and have for eight years. The first house we lived in there was seriously haunted. Shortly after we moved in, the odd occurrences started. The first one I can remember was about three months or so after we moved in. Our youngest daughter was two, and her toy box was set up in a hallway that ran from our dining room to the front door, with our stairs acting as a wall and separator from our living room. I was playing on my phone and she was on the other side of the stairs playing with her toys. Suddenly, I hear her come running through the hallway and into the living room. When I looked up at her, there is no way to describe her face other than terrified. Her eyes were wide with fear and she ran as fast as she could to jump onto the couch with me. When I asked what was wrong, she pointed to the hallway and said, "'Dat man scare me.' My blood ran cold. We were the only two at home. My husband was at work and my older daughter was at school, so there definitely should not have been any man in my house. When I asked what man, she just kept pointing to the hallway and saying, "'Dat man over dare. I grabbed a small wooden bat from a toy bin at the end of our couch and crept into the hallway. There was no one there. I carefully walked around the entire first floor, searching the storage space under our stairs, our laundry room, and our pantry. No one there. No one could have snuck upstairs without me hearing. The old wooden stairs in our home were notoriously creaky, and the door leading to our garage was also very loud. There was no way anyone could have gotten out of the living areas without me hearing them. I was officially freaked out and told my husband about it as soon as the kids went to bed that night. He chalked it up to our daughter's vivid imagination. The second weird occurrence happened a few weeks later. My husband was a soldier in the army, and after physical training in the mornings, he would come home to shower and change into his uniform for the day. He was taking a shower in our bathroom when he thought he saw someone walking through our bedroom. Our shower curtain had a clear panel across the top, and he showered with the door open because of poor ventilation in the bathroom. From the doorway of the bathroom, you had a clear view of our bedroom. He said out of the corner of his eye, he had seen someone walk up next to our bed and bend over our nightstand. But when he asked me about it, I told him that I had never come upstairs. He was weirded out, but thought maybe he imagined it. We ended up getting a dog shortly after. Our beautiful bulldog was named Eleanor, and unfortunately, soon after getting her, we learned that our youngest daughter was deathly allergic to her. Because of our daughter's allergies, Eleanor had to stay downstairs, and at night we would kennel her in our dining room. It wasn't long until she began to bark at the hallway the same hallway my daughter had claimed to see a man that scared her in. Eleanor's hair on the back of her neck would stand up, and she would bark at something we couldn't see. At first we thought maybe it could be mice, despite no other signs that we had them. We set traps and never caught anything. We ended up having to rehome our sweet Eleanor due to my daughter's allergies, but for the entire two years we had her, she hated that hallway and would refuse to walk through it. The most terrifying event that ever happened to me when we lived in that house was the night I saw him. I was laying in bed playing on my phone while my husband slept beside me. It was around 1 a.m. and I decided I needed to try to get some sleep since I'd have to get my oldest up for school the following morning. I had been facing our bathroom and the door to our bedroom. I rolled over to snuggle up to my husband and standing in the corner of our room was a soldier in full uniform. The room was dark, but because of a street lamp right outside the window, he was well illuminated. I screamed and smacked my husband to wake up, and as soon as my husband jumped, the soldier took one step toward the bed and disappeared into thin air. I was hysterical. My husband told me that I had to have been dreaming, but I had never been to sleep, and I knew what I saw. He had been so solid I would have sworn he was a real person, until, of course, he faded away right before my eyes. I was terrified, and it took me forever to fall asleep. The next day, I talked to a friend of mine who had lived on our street for a few years. 
At first, I simply asked if she had ever heard of anyone else on post complaining about their house being haunted. She said yes and asked me why. I didn't tell her what I saw, but I did tell her that weird stuff had been happening in our house. She immediately got uncomfortable and said, Well, you know a guy that used to live on our street killed himself in his house, right? I was shocked. I said no and I asked her when it happened. She explained that when she and her husband first moved in, they used to have block parties in the cul-de-sac at the end of our street. Shortly after they moved in, they went to a block party to meet the neighbors, and someone at the party told them it was a good thing they hadn't moved in a few months earlier, because one of their neighbors had committed suicide after returning home from war. They said he suffered from extreme PTSD and shot himself one night. With it being a military post, the sound hadn't really shaken up the whole neighborhood, like it might in other ones. My friend wasn't sure exactly which house it happened in, but judging from what we had all seen and experienced in my house, I was sure it was mine. We had tons of other experiences in that house. We lived there for six of the eight years that we lived at Fort Campbell, and there was always something weird or unexplainable happening there. My family and I, me, my husband, my three-year-old daughter, and two-month-old son, moved into a rental home in College Station, Texas. This home was built in the 70s. About a month after living in our home, our daughter, who has always slept well through the night, started waking us up multiple times a night. One night, she woke us up by climbing into our bed crying. We let her sleep with us, and in the morning, she said that she saw a ghost with a blanket over their head. My husband and I thought it was a dream, because most kids see ghosts depicted in shows with a white sheet over their head. Then, a few weeks after that, I woke up in the night to feed my son. I put him back in his bassinet by our bed, and was laying in bed facing his bassinet trying to fall back asleep. I then see a figure the size of my daughter, with a blanket over their head, walk by the bassinet, look at my son, and run out of the room. Mind you, our daughter never just comes in and leaves without saying anything. I thought it was strange, so I got up to check on her. She is sound asleep in her bed. Then, a few nights later, I feel a tickle on my toes at night in bed. One time when my daughter and I were having a disagreement, the light started flickering. I have always believed in the supernatural, but my husband has always been a skeptic, until he saw it himself. One night, laying in bed, he felt a brush on his arm and saw a figure by his bedside run off. He got up to check on our daughter and she was dead asleep. I called my mom one day to tell her about all of this, and she said that she saw the same spirit in her home. She was babysitting my daughter one weekend at her home and got up in the night to get some water. She saw a small child in the dark hallway and went to check on my daughter, who was dead asleep. Do we have a child ghost in our home? Is it following my daughter? How can we get the history on our rental home? It's very interesting.